Hi there, everybody. Sophie Aldred here, a.k.a. Ace from Doctor Who, and you are listening to the Sirens of Audio podcast. I don't know who you are or what you are, but we've got Doctor Who fans all over the world poised for a new season. If And if we don't act now, the required number of episodes for the new season will have to be cut back to eight. Those episodes will not return. Why not? It is unimportant now, but we must get them back. There really is no point. They could never be made now. But don't you care? Care? No. Why should I care? Because we're fans and without new episodes, we're going to die. I do not understand you. There are fans dying on the inside all over your world, yet you do not care about them. You will be wondering what has happened. Your RSS feeds must have just discovered a new podcast. Is that not so? Yes, that's right. That is where we come from. It is called The Sirens of Audio. The Sirens of Audio? But isn't that one of the ancient names of a Nick Briggs story? Yes. Eons ago, our show was cancelled and we drifted away on a journey to another medium. Now we have returned. But who or what are you? We are called audiophiles. Audiophiles? Yes, audiophiles. We were exactly like you once, but our creative community realised that our hunger for new material was getting stronger. Stronger? How? TV stories had disappeared, so fan writers and producers created spare parts for our imagination until our thirst for good stories could be almost completely satisfied. But that means you're not like us. You're potential showrunners. Our brains are just like yours, except certain weaknesses have been removed. Weaknesses? What weaknesses? You call it bad taste, do you not? But that's terrible. You mean you wouldn't care about someone's poorly created entertainment? There would be no need. We have far better things to do. But we don't. We know. That is why we have come to assist you. Prepare for audiophile conversion. G'day audio files. it's 2022. How are we all? My name's Dwayne. And my name's Philip. G'day Dwayne, g'day audio files. And our special guest, Kenny. G'day Kenny. G'day mate. <laughs> that was very good. You've been practising, haven't you? I did actually, I'm not lying, I did. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Sirens of Audio, we are the podcast that explores the universe of Doctor Who and the audio medium. Uh, it's a great pl- privilege to have you on the show this time, Kenny, uh, as uh, the man on the on the ground uh, in terms of big finish um there's some great things coming up ahead for 2022 isn't there oh absolutely i mean just as we speak i'm i'm really excited for the eighth doctor and charlotte pollard the further adventurous yeah. to drop yeah and oh there's plenty of great stuff coming up there's uh, avengers there's more space 1999 more ninth doctor more tenth doctor just oh, so much to look forward to and genuinely second, i am second excited. doctor I'm so excited about the second Doctor let's, coming back. Let's not forget that, because I called that uh, mm-hmm. in October 2020. Uh, I said, yes, I think Big Finish should be casting Michael Troughton as the second Doctor. And I've always thought that ever since I heard that reading of uh, the Patrick Troughton biography. Mm-hmm. That if you haven't heard that, make sure you give it a listen, because it's uh, his, his, I don't know about his Doctor uh, impressions so much, but his Pat Troughton impressions, which is probably not too different, are sensational. It's spot on. Um, so, yeah, that's that's definitely something I'm very excited about. And I didn't expect to be getting that so soon in The Annihilators, only next month. Yeah, it's one that I've known about for a wee while, and it's one of those ones where you've got to, like, because mm, obviously there was the false cover 
and then yes, we had yes. the real cover reveal uh, on the first. So yes, that was that was quite good fun, and uh, yeah, I, I I like it when I know these wee things and just. Sort of like... <laughs> <laughs> well, I was looking forward to Nicholas Briggs doing the analysis, and I know he loves the Third Doctor, but I thought it doesn't seem like a really big enough thing to for him to be spending so much time on. And of course, once I realised, oh, the Second Doctor's there too, I thought, oh, no wonder he's taking it. He can't help himself. And uh, I'm at, as we speak, as we record this, I'm downloading uh, Doctor Who 40, the Peter Davison 40-year anniversary special, part one, uh, featuring, what's the first one featuring? Ice Warriors, isn't it? Uh, it's got Ice Warriors and, oh my goodness, gosh, I did this, I did this preview month, about four months ago. And uh, it's just, it's funny how it's sort of like you, you sort of, you're working on the current thing and then as soon as you move on to the next one, clonk it's gone um philip's yeah, telling me there's... philip's philip's looking it up i can see him i'm trying tapping away i know but i'm gonna be a while yet though oh this is oh, i'm all set up for something else i have to look now let me have a look what's on yeah, the cover i'm downloading 40 as we speak as well it's i just realized ice warriors and so... ice warriors and cybermen how could yeah. i forget the cybermen of course Drop return to me. telos so oh, yeah. return to that telos, that's been done it's the secrets of telos isn't it that's it. Yeah, awesome stuff. But we're not here tonight to talk about 2022 so much as a retrospective of 2021, because that as well was a rather eventful year for Big Finish, an exciting year too. Some exciting things happened throughout the year, uh, some great releases, and uh, going to go through some of the standouts for each of us throughout that particular year. So, uh, of course, in 2021, we had the debut of Christopher Eccleston as the Ninth Doctor. We had Dalek Universe with David Tennant. That was an epic spanning spanning the year. Um, so I wonder if any of those stood out to us as we go through. So I think uh, what we'll do is we'll we'll pick out each of us for each month. We'll pick out a standout release, and we'll talk about it just for a few minutes. We'll see if. We're, Philip and I, Kenny, are notorious for going way longer than we promise ourselves, mm -hmm. but we're going to try and be very strict today and stick to stick to two to three minutes. So do you think you can do that, Philip? He's not, he's not answering. <laughs> he's not answering. He's not committing. He's not committing. Do you want uh, me to lie, do you, Dwayne? <laughs> that's okay. We'll go I will as do long, my best. We'll go as long as it takes, but we, we've got uh, at least 36 releases we're going to go through and uh, um, wax lyrical about and, and, and rave about and gush over, uh, plus a, a couple of uh, honourable mentions as well in there. So we'll, we better get started with January uh, 2021. And as you're the guest, Kenny, we'll go to you first. What was your standout release for, for January 2021? Well, th there was really tough to pick. Because, as I think we'll all agree that every single month that was really, really hard to pick out one standout release. But I have gone for Masterful, the 50th anniversary celebration of the Master, strangely enough, bringing together various incarnations and adding John Simmons to the mix as well, which was something new for us through Big Finish. And I just thought it was a wonderful tale. You've got the Master, the Masters, and Missy all up to their mischievous machinations. And it's just such a wonderful, wonderful mix. Different masters being paired off. I love the fact that we got the return of Alex's McQueen's ma Alex McQueen's master, oh, yeah. yep. who I'm a big fan of. I love Alex. And just to have this celebration, lots of masters, and we don't need to worry about the doctor showing up. The fact that the master is front and centre multiple times over. I think in fact, you've got a very clever script from James Goss and the master pairings are just masterfully selected. You've got such a, a wonderful contrast between them all. You've got wonderful Jeffrey Beavers being so cold and calculating. And then you move on to the likes of, as I said, Alex McQueen or indeed Missy, who are larger than life and over the top. And then throw in John Sim making his big finish debut and wow. What a performance he's just you can tell he's absolutely relishing it and having the chance to work with Derek Jacobi at long last because obviously when they did the regeneration it was a couple of weeks apart oh, of so course, they yeah. finally got the chance to meet up and I just thought the the dynamic between them is great and it just shows you that if you cast the right person you cannot go wrong with the master if they've got that 
level of malevolence and playfulness. And it's just, a, for me, it's just a very clever, strong release that just has, is just punch after punch after punch. And it's so funny as well, because while well, the master usually tends to take himself or herself very seriously, here there's so many laughs and the master is aware of how ridiculous they are at times. And for me, it, it was just, a, it was just such a damn good release. And I actually think I feel like putting it on to listen to. I actually remember listening to it exactly a year ago. I went for a walk. Uh, for me, it's the morning. It's uh, it's just gone 10.39 a.m. And uh, I was out for a walk two hours ago doing exactly the same route that I listened to Masterful on, I've just realised. So, yeah, I thoroughly recommend it to anyone who's not got it yet. Mm. Absolutely. The standout performance in that for me was uh, was Eric Roberts. He sold me like he'd never done before. I think he was only in one release prior to that, wasn't he? Um, and his he he was so nasty to Jeffrey Beavers. Is that right, Philip? Am I getting that right? Yeah, no, you are. That that, that to me was a standout because Jeffrey Beavers actually had some sympathy for. He sort of fell in mm. love, and you actually had hope for him. And Eric Roberts just totally destroyed him just for the joy of it. And it, yeah, it was a, it was an amazing, yeah, great release. We, we devoted yeah. an entire episode to it last year, Dwayne, because we were so impressed by it. We did. Yeah, I think we did. you've got, I just say Eric Roberts is great. I mean, he was great when he did his uh, River Song. And then, okay, we did, maybe perhaps wasn't quite as active in proceedings in Ravenous, but he was very, very good in that. Just that, I think he's, get, I think he's finally, people understand how his master works now. And I think James was absolutely to, able to go to town on it and have such fun with him and just real relish into his nasty side, which we get glimpses of in the TV movie. And here he's just able to just, he's honed it to perfection. Mm. Beautiful. Excellent choice. Thanks, Kenny. Let's move over to you, Philip. What was your choice for January? Well, it was very hard because <laughs> there's so many good choices, but I'm actually going to do a sort of a representative one for the year. Uh, I've chosen some coffee by Torchwood. Uh, Torchwood, of course, is our final monthly series that survived because one of the things that ended this year quite sadly but i think it was time was the monthly range so after 20 years or so there's no more monthly doctor who's uh classic range coming out anymore but torchwood is the one range that has continued with its monthly releases and it is always such an amazingly high standard and it kicked off as a brilliant example with coffee um this was for anyone who loves torchwood it was a, it was a perfect show to, to kick things off with gareth david lloyd uh, is just wonderful uh, in this playing Yanto Jones. There's only two other members of the cast. It's basically all set inside a coffee shop and it's set over several years. And if you know the Torchwood history of the TV show, it keeps coming in and out of the Torchwood history. Um, so you just know that's happening. So in terms of you know, every major event that happened, Yanto would come over and talk coffee or the, the room would explode as aliens invaded. Or, so all the different storylines. So it was a lovely homage to the whole TV show. But more than that, as I said, it's, it totally just shows what you can achieve with a very small cast, but being unbelievably inventive. Um, nearly everything that's been written by James Goss, I don't know how he manages to, to write what he's writing in terms of every month, plus he's doing other ranges as well. Um, and he keeps changing his style. So Coffee was fairly lighthearted on the whole, but it did get quite serious and you know very emotional at times. Which you know James is able to do. So yeah, I just want to pay homage to the whole Torchwood range. Um, I'm sure some other Torchwood may get popped up along the way, but I just thought it was a good way to start with the monthly range and, and coffee. Fantastic, thanks, Philip. I think I, that's I, your that's your three minutes, isn't it? All right. So for my release uh, that stood out to me, very similar to you, Kenny, comes from the Masterful set, but the Deluxe set of Masterful, and this is the only place that this particular release can be found. And that is an audiobook reading of Terror of the Master. It was written by Trevor Baxendale, performed by John Colshaw. It's a third Doctor and Roger Delgado master story. And it runs for about three and a half hours, I think, from memory. And it it seems like it goes for 30 minutes. It is it takes it took me right back to uh, the Pertwee years that were, well, he was my doctor. The the repeats in the early 80s of the Pertwee years, that was what hooked me on Doctor Who. So the way John Colshaw does these readings is absolutely sensational. We'd 
had the announcement that he was going to be coming up with Scourge of the Cybermen later in the year. So this was like a bit of a taster of what was to come. And if anyone had any uh, hesitation of an audiobook, so audiobooks you've got to invest a bit more time in. So uh, particularly the full length ones go for about seven, eight hours. But this was about half that. Um, as a taster, this was absolutely perfect. I, I wonder if Big Finish at some point are going to release this separately because it de definitely deserves its a separate release. I believe. Uh, I think it's just a matter of time before before they do. Maybe they're waiting to see what the what the other audio book ranges do. We've only had one so far. We've we've um, we've got another one coming out uh, this month. But uh, but Terror of the Master was the standout for me. It, it was just I, I came away from that just going wow. Uh, I don't know what you fellas thought of, of of that one as well. Yeah, magnificent. I think it's the fact you've got a first class narrator in John Coltshaw, who absolutely draws you in. The fact that you can do the voices helps as well, and the music sound design on it and everything. It really is a special little package. The fact that it's echoing Terror of the Autons and so many of its themes and even its title. It's very, very well done. And I think Trevor is such a really good underrated writer when it comes to these books. He's definitely got a nice wee skill there, particularly, as, I don't know if you've heard his Blake Seven, which came out at the end of last year. It, very, very good. And I loved it. I mean, it's, it's no it's no being skill reading a bit of text as, you know, having done the, the short trips yourselves over the Christmas period, which were great to listen to. Love Parliament of Rats. And even just adding a wee bit of sound design and music here and there, even if it's from somewhere else, it takes ages to do. So there's a real skill in it, and I loved it. Yeah, I looked at the credits. Was it Joe Kramer that did that on uh, Terror of the Master, do you recall? Um, I couldn't see any other sound designer, so I'm assuming that the whole thing was done by Joe Kramer. And to have such a accomplished um, uh, sound designer and musician... Uh, to be working on Big Finish, I think that's absolutely thrilling. You, you interviewed Joe Kramer recently, didn't you? I did, yes. I had him on an episode of Power of Three when we were talking about the Missy box set. And he's just absolutely amazing, really, really laid back, fabulous, friendly, chatty bloke, because I've interviewed him a few times by email, and that was the first time we'd spoken in person, and it was like speaking to an old mate. And, yeah, it was, it was a fab, lovely, lovely guy and as well. But you think, this guy's doing Big Finish. He's done Tom Cruise Mission Impossible film mm. and I think he's done another Tom Cruise one as well but yeah fabulous mm. I love the fact that didn't he do Jack Reacher Is yes that the one he did? that's the other one I, just, I love the fact that he talked to you about the fact he was helping his son was getting involved too so he's using Big Finish to train his son up so that was a, a nice touch I, I just thought the um, the whole mass episode caught me up because it felt like a full cast production and then I, I kept getting caught up in the story, feeling like like it was full cast, and going, "Oh no, it's just one narrator." It was, yeah, it was so well done. It was brilliant. Okay, so let's move on to February. We'll stay in the same order, eh? So let's go with uh, Kenny. What was your standout for February twenty twenty one? I am a big Fourth Doctor fan. That was the year of the show where I started watching back in nineteen seventy eight ish, when I was four years old and sitting on my mum's knee as she'd a thing for Tom Baker. I don't quite get it, but there we go. Anyway, The Tribulations of Thaddeus Nuke is my choice, which was previously known as Thaddeus Nuke's Time Tours. That was its working title. And I just thought it's fantastic. It's very much swept me up in the journey. You've got the Doctor and Leela and the encounter, a gentleman by the name of Thaddeus Nuke, who's offering time tours. And Leela gets swept up and caught along with his tour. And the Doctor's got to pursue him. And obviously we all know what happens when you human beings meddle with time. Things don't tend to go too well. So you've got the Doctor chasing after uh, in pursuit. And I think it's a great story. It, plenty of laughs along the way. Andrew Smith. I'm not just, I've not just picked this one because Andy's a good pal of mine. Um, I think Andy's such a clever writer. And I think this is one of his funniest scripts to date. Usually stories can be a bit more serious, but this one I thought was hilarious made me laugh in the right places and this is great characters and I think Thaddeus Nuke himself was brilliant it's that sort of um, wheeler dealer sort of bloke who's to sort of come across this wonderful piece of technology and he's out to make a few quid out of it and Tom Baker, Louise Jameson in top form as ever and I just, it just swept me along and I think I listened to this in one go as I recall I went out for a walk 
and I enjoyed it so much, I just kept walking. Kept on walking. finished it all in one <laughs> yeah. go. Oh, very good. Excellent. Yeah, it really is a great range, and it's, it's, it's nice to know that there are many, many more years of Fourth Doctor adventures to come. Mm -hmm. uh, because we all know Tom Baker's getting old, so if anything should happen, uh, it's not the end of him. We've we've got lots to go, so it's it's really nice yeah. that uh, that he's done that for for us as fans. Yeah, the moment has been prepared for. Exactly, exactly. All right, Philip, what about you? Um, I'm going to pick the uh, another one, which was an end of a range. So that maybe we'll see Gallifrey. Um, so the the Gallifrey Time War box set came out uh, in February. Um, once again, they, one of the things I've loved, appreciated about Gallifrey recently is the fact that they're using, uh, I guess, lesser-known authors, but new authors or building people up. But it's amazing that just, I was just looking through the authors. So there was um, Lisa McMullen, who during the course of a year has become one of my favourite writers because she's just writing more and more and her stuff is very powerful. Lou Morgan, who I'm going to actually refer to again later, uh, also did another favourite in a couple of months because... Um, that writing is just so powerful and emotional. Uh, David Llewellyn is always reliable and Matt Fitton. So it's, it's sort of a box set of kind of new people, but they don't feel new anymore after a year of having so, many out, so much output from them and others. Um, but just trying to end up the time war with Gallifrey, trying to leave it in a, a helpful spot, which doesn't contradict the TV series, which was nice. But it's just a cast of characters that I've just grown so fond of over the time. So, you know, Lala Ward, Louise Jameson is just amazing as always. Um, also, it's just great, Sean Carlson. I think Sean Carlson's one of my favourite actors. In terms of when Gallifrey started, I hated him. And um, we, 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 had, we had Sean on during the year. And I actually said to him, you know, I really hated you. When I, <laughs> you know, your character, everything about you, I hated. And how he's managed to turn this obnoxious, overconfident, overbearing civil servant into someone that we care so much about over the course of the seasons, is a real power to his acting. And I guess, it, I was upset about how young he was, because to me he always seemed, you know, old autocrat. But, you know, he's actually still a young man, even after um, however many years they've been doing Gallifrey. So I just think... He's our age. We're young men, aren't we? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's what I meant. Forty uh, somethings. Yeah. So, once again, Scott Hancock. I mean, there's going to be an awful lot of stuff I'm going to be re referencing that Scott Hancock directed. Sort of the, the young upcoming director who is um, doing a lot of edgier stuff, and I think Gallifrey Time Time War went more edgy this time. So they're saying it's the end. I'm hoping not. There's still bits to happen, but yeah, maybe like Survivors, they'll put it aside for a few years and it'll come back. It, yeah, it's one of those things that often ends and comes back. But yeah, all of Gallifrey is amazing. The first three seasons in particular are astounding in terms of political intrigue and just clever twists and Gary Russell's in his element of soapy writing for Dynasty, for come West Wing, come everything else. But just to see how it's progressed on in the box sets and where Scott Hancock's taken it to, um, really worth the listen. And yeah, you, you do need to listen to all the Time War box sets. Don't just dive into this one, but really worthwhile. If you, if you want to understand the Time War and its fullness, Gallifrey is a great place to start. Yeah, and no, at, at the time that came out, I'd, I'd just recently watched The Hobbit too. So uh, with Richard Armitage playing Rassilon, I was interested to see how he was going to do that. Um, I, I, I did feel that he was a little bit underused, so I felt a little bit disappointed there. But a, apart from that, a fantastic, fantastic release. And I certainly hope there's more to come. I'm sure Nick, to, Nick has dropped uh, a hint in a podcast that he's, that he's looked at future scripts. I'm sure he has, unless I'm imagining things. We'll see. What about you, Dwayne? What did you like in February? Uh, February for me, we had the first full box set release of Space 1999. And this absolutely blew me away. When I was a kid, Space 1999 used to be on. I think I was even watching it before I went to school because uh, it, it was on at 10.30, 11 o'clock in the morning. Do you remember that, Philip? I do. Years and years ago. I used to watch it every and do the holidays. You know, yeah, yeah. I think every that's day. when I got it during the holidays, and so I'd, I'd try and get off school after I went to school too, and then oh, I'd always try and put on Space Nineteen Ninety Nine. And it's the sounds; it's got such unique sounds in the original series, and they've managed to replicate these at, that in a way that takes you right back. And not only that, but they've improved it too. And uh, one of the one of the best things about that is the is the title theme. Benji Clifford redid this, 
and he he just he didn't really change it too much but he just added a couple of extra little things there that when you put when you're listening to it with your headphones it it makes just thinking about it, i'm getting goosebumps that's how it sort of got into my head and it sort of got me right in the mood for those for those stories um three stories on the box set altogether the siren called by andrew smith uh, and goldilocks was by andrew smith um, so they're two original ones, but they're doing sort of a, a combination of originals plus reworkings of TV episodes. So Roland Moore did uh, Death's Other Dominion, which I hadn't seen for a long time. So I, I listened to that first and then I went and got the original back out. And you know what? I enjoyed the Big Finish, Big Finish version much more than the TV version. Even though it does have Brian Blessed in it, uh, I still like this one better. I did the other way around. I watched it first and then I listened and I went... Big Finch is better. It actually made more sense and more yep. logic, and yeah. Did you did you do that too, Kenny? Well, I discovered it in Saturday morning repeats on Scottish television, our local sort of ITV station, and they used to show it in Saturday morning. So that was how I first discovered nineteen ninety nine, and I've actually don't own the originals on DVD or Blu Ray or anything, but they have been repeating them on one of the satellite channels here, and I've watched a few, but they tended to be season two. Yeah. that I've caught up yeah. with and as we all know season two just isn't quite as good as the first um the first yeah. half is got okay. a different feel got a different feel about it I'm not sure yeah. but I really enjoyed the audios I think they're great they just feel fantastic and I think Mark Bonner is brilliant and to clear an interest Mark Bonner's a friend but uh yeah I'm uh, absolutely love what he's done with it and I know that he's having a ball because he was a big fan he watched the repeats when I was watching them at the same time, obviously not at the same house or anything like that. But yeah, both big fans of it back in the day. Awesome. So do all you Scottish people just get together once a week or something? To, do you all happen to know each other? Is that just how it works? Yeah, we do. We, we have a Cayley. Uh, we go and chase some haggis, stick them on. <laughs> you know, we, murder, we murder the wee haggises, we chase them up a hill, and then we stick them over a fire, roast them, and then we drink whiskey and iron brew. So yeah, that's that's basically what we call <laughs> Thursday night. And everybody in Scotland, all five million of us get together to do that. So it's great fun. Great. Cool. <laughs> On that note, Kenny, tell us what your pick for March 2021 was. Well, again, it's a fourth Doctor release, and this one was really nostalgic for me. It's the Doomsday Contract by John Lloyd, which was adapted and developed by Nev Fountain. Uh, season 17 was is, is probably one of my most favourite classic series, series, and I thoroughly enjoyed getting the box set. Uh, on Blu-ray just before Christmas. So fingers crossed you guys get it very soon too. And yeah, next I just month. love it. Early next month. Yeah. Awesome. It's, it's fab. There's, it's just, I love the whole tone of that era. It's quite flippant. Just the whole Dr. Romana, K-19, and the fact they're just untouchable and they're just having such a good laugh as they go about and laughing in the face of terror and tweaking the nose of the spindly killer fish and that sort of thing as to borrow a black address. But they're just... Do it with such a land and style. And the Doomsday contract is absolutely perfect for that season 17 style with people wanting to destroy Earth to make way for uh, pretty much... Basically, it's, it's the basic plot is Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, but there's far more to it than that, and it diverges hugely. And We've got courtroom fun and the Doctor and Romana just going off. and oh, it's, it's if People haven't heard it. I'd hugely recommend it, particularly with season 17 coming out, I would go out and get it because what Nev has done, he's a, obviously a huge fan of that era. He's a comedy writer and he just makes it, it just is so vivid and you can picture it, the guitar just being impounded, things like that. And it's there's some wonderful legalese stuff at the start, just playing on the ridiculousness of the British court system. And yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd recommend it hugely. I don't want to spoil it for anyone I know it's been out for a few months, but yeah, it's very funny, very clever. And Tom and Lala are just on top form. Hugely, we, hugely recommended. We had Nev on the show earlier in the year talking a little bit about this and because it hadn't been released when we were speaking with him, but uh, he was he was talking about the relationship between Douglas Adams and uh, John Lloyd, isn't it? That's right, John Lloyd? Mm -hmm. yep. Um, yep. And listening to this, it's amazing how hitchhiker it is and it made me think how much of john lloyd must be in hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy because he was so uh uh he contributed so much with douglas adams uh, particularly the radio series i think 
Um, so yeah, absolutely sensate. It, it would, it's, it's kind of hidden because it's released not too long after another, uh, lost story that got a lot of hype, the return of the Cybermen. But, mm -hmm. uh, you, a lot of fans might go for the Cybermen one over this, uh, because it's Cybermen, but, um, I think this one came out uh, a little better than Return of the Cybermen, and um, it was it, it's certainly a, a bit of a hidden gem in 2021. It would have to be probably in my top five if I had to pick, definitely. Huge laughs I got out of it. Yep. Uh, who's next? Philip, what about okay. you for March? Well, you, you kind of stole the one I was going to have, but what I'll, I'll do with my, my second choice, which is still pretty up there. Um, I'm actually choosing Master. Um, so we spoke to Eric Roberts before, um, he came back for Masterful, he'd been, you know, featured in a River Song and, uh, uh, Ravages earlier, but this is for his first own box set. Uh, so he and Chase Masterson, um, playing the assassin, I forget what her name is. Vienna Salvatore. Yes, thank you, Vienna Salvatore. Um, they sort of team up. It's, once again, it's... It gives a good reason for why suddenly Eric Roberts is in human form, or, or maybe the Gallifreyan form, um, how he gets pulled out of the ether, or whatever it is. But there's a, there's a real growing sense of disaster and impending doom, as he at first seems so sweet, so nice, but just how he manipulates and controls situations. So, um, yeah, once again, so impressed by Eric Roberts. He didn't get to do it anywhere near enough on the show and it's just lovely seeing him bit by bit coming back it left with a cliffhanger so i'm hoping there's going to be an announcement soon about a second box but i've heard nothing coming so i don't you know hoping its sales were good but in terms of um different qualities of the master eric roberts brings a whole new side really worth listening to um once again you know the the, the cast are all great i mean chase matt chase Masterson is just wonderful as always um, Howard Carr does the music score, so it's, that's always brilliant. Um, and Jamie Anderson did the directing. Well, Jason Hay Gallery obviously directed in America, so and I think that's I think both Chase Madison and um, Eric Roberts were directed in America, and then over here Jamie Anderson did the the rest of the cast, and then as they do their usual mashup now, it, it's interesting because I know that. So many of these people never performed together. So, you know, Tom Baker, Lala Ward have never been in the same room, haven't seen each other, haven't spoken to each other, and yet you would not have a clue that's going on when you listen to the CDs. I guess the CDs, I'm talking about old age now, aren't I? The audios. Um, because they're just, the way the sound technicians just do their work is just brilliant. Uh, and, you know, as I said, you know, Howard Carter's done the sound design as well as the music. I can't fault how he manages to put together different countries, different people, months apart and yet it just falls together the sound design is spotless and you get this ripping story so yeah i, I still stay to me the big fish managed to do it i can't imagine the painful process of cutting it all together track up line after line and merging them but it also, i think it actually just shows when we spoke to um benji during the year that actually the sound design has a lot of power in terms of um pacing how things sound the pauses and so an entire performance can be totally altered and changed for the better or for the worse by the sound designer. I don't think we give them anywhere enough credit for the part they play in making a story really work. What about you, Dwayne? What are you going to recommend for this month? Uh, for, for me, uh, it was a sad month for me, Philip. I know you weren't so sad about this, but uh, it, was, it was a very long time that I've been subscribing to the monthly adventures. And this was the very last one. The end of the beginning. Rob Valentine wrote this uh, great story, and uh, to to wrap everything up, uh, as far as the monthly range was concerned, I I've got to say, sitting here now, uh, nine months later, I I have missed them. I really have, um, and I will say for those who were very excited uh, with Kevin McNally being in the TV series a couple of months ago, well, we we at Big Finish, I say we, the Royal We at Big Finish had him. Not once, but twice. And this was his first appearance in uh, Big Finish Adventure so far, unless he was in more than two, but I know two off the top of my head I can think of, uh, playing the, the main protagonist in, in this. And uh, it was it was great. It was, And it was also nice to have that little scene with Sylvester McCoy 
because it looked for a while as if uh, Sylvester was not going to be able to take part. But at the end of the day, he did get a bit of a scene and that was marvellous. So to have those four doctors who had started off the monthly range and kept it going for 20 years, it was absolutely amazing. I'm still sad about it. Uh, but that, that was the standout for me for, for, for March. So uh, I don't know if you guys have anything to say about the monthlies and that one. I do miss them. I, I, I particularly enjoyed the end of the, the beginning. A, a wonderful title as well and with a nice double meaning. But I think it's quite, it's wonderful the way it echoes the structure of the Sirens of Time, whereas every yes. Doctor has their own episode before they all come together at the end. And the fact that there's such a wonderful trick played on us with Kevin McNally's character, I won't say what it is, but I did not expect that. And yeah, a wonderful. And of course he did, a, I think he did a one part one back in the days of when the, the monthly range went to the trilogies and he did a one part story when there was a three parter and a one parter. And I can't remember which one it was off to have head, but I'm sure he did one. So yeah, he's been coming back to Big Finish long before the TV series came a calling for him. So yeah, I really enjoyed it and I do miss them. I do miss them. Yeah, it's interesting that, you know, reflecting on my 12 episodes, I actually don't have a traditional Doctor Who show in my top 12 for the monthly range. Um, which Except is, this one. You did pick this one. I, I did, I, yeah, I did pick this one. And as much as I I was, I did agree that I thought the monthly range was coming to its natural conclusion. Um, I've become more fond of the one hour episodes and keeping them tight and brief and what you can do with that. Uh, I nostalgically, I'm looking back now going, oh yeah, I've missed it. And also, I think because we've just, I'm so used to always having Colin or Pete or Sylvester uh, in my ears every month. And of course, yeah, they, they, they did some good things, but we really did lose the regularity and the length of, of having them like we used to. So I'm, I'm, I'm missing those doctors a bit, even yeah. though I'm not denying we've had a marvellous output anyway. Yeah. Well, that's why 2022 is, uh, they're, they're, they're back. So we're looking forward to that. And it's about time. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. From Big Finish Productions. It was the end of everything. Finally, I realized the purpose for which I had been chosen. I declared war on the universe. Doctor. Charlo. Before we die, can we at least agree that this was all your fault? If it makes you happier. Not really. The city. It is said to house a great jewel known as the Zalam. The darkness. Good grief. By all that's holy. Don't be alarmed. This is simply an artifact of another civilization. It's a lot more impressive than yours, isn't it? Size isn't everything. Well, Mrs. Clark, welcome to Huygens End Spaceport. Life is fast and short in these parts, so be careful. Sounds like the Wild West. From my obsidian throne in the Fortress of Night, I assembled the means to begin my war. Doctor, Mrs. C, welcome aboard the Black Star. Charming, I'm sure. I am a Time Lord. A Time Lord? Oh, is that supposed to impress me? They're following us. Can we outrun them? They've taken out my starboard thruster. Doctor, you better think of something. Oh, rather dark, isn't it? Don't worry, love. You'll be safe with me. There's a new child of the night in town. Another one like you? When I started selling off my paintings, I thought I was being completely discreet. I should hope so, Highgate. Artists do usually tend to stop painting once they're dead. Oh. Oh no. We might very well be standing on all that's left of, you know... The lost moon of Batoya. Doctor. Hello, Doctor. And Charlie, isn't it? You remember Tello? Doctor, is that really a future version of you? Indeed it is. Oh, you become awfully... Um, what? Tasteful. There is a legend, a prophecy, if you will, of a great unravelling. And it's said to have started here. To me, it sounds more like a weapon. No wonder the ancients hid it. In the wrong hands, it would be a terrible thing. 
What have you done? Isn't it obvious, my boy? I've started it up! Big finish. We love stories. <laughs> Funny thing, time travel, isn't it? All right, so April, uh, there was another end of a series of stories, Kenny. Um, what stood out to you in April? My choice for this one is Time Lord Victorious Echoes of Extinction. I thought I'd try and make it sound slightly more epic there by saying it like that. Uh, I really enjoyed the big finish Time Lord Victorious run. Three fab tales, plus also you've got to add in the Tom Baker one as well, which mm. fits in there quite nicely. And then we have the ones that top and tail it all in the Echoes of Extinction written it's just fabulous, fabulous stories from Alfie Shaw, whose name just popped out my head for a minute. Sorry, Alfie. And wonderful Eighth Doctor story to start it all off, throwing, and it throws up a, a wonderful possibility of potentially there might even be a new companion in there. That I doubt it will happen, but that's just my thing because I'm a big fan of two pints of, of lager and a packet of crisps. And one of the Sheridan Smith's co stars joins the TARDIS crew briefly. Uh, of course, she was also Bliss in the TV episode Blink. Um, no, it wasn't Blink, it's Love and Monsters. Um, so yeah, I'm, I was a big fan of this one. And then, of course, you've got the B-side with David Tennant taking it over and sort of topping and tailing the story. I think it was a, a very clever release. It's one that you definitely have to listen to and follow it carefully. It needs your full attention. I think Alfie did a great job on it. And the fact that even though the Doctors don't meet, which I'm sure a lot of people were hoping for i think it's actually quite nice that they don't there is an intermittent doctor hearing the eighth doctor and remembering and sort of thinking oh the things you've got ahead of you but it will get better and i think that was quite a nice wee touch and the really nice thing is that uh, i can exclusively reveal that we will be chatting about echoes of extinction in series three of the Pieces of Eighth podcast series, as we've got a couple of episodes all about Time Lord Victorious and the Eighth Doctor's involvement in there. So there we go. Uh, something just to plug it. And I've just got one interview still to do for that, and then it'll all be sorted. But no, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the fact that it was on vinyl. I did obviously listen to the download version first, but it's really nice having it in vinyl. You get that nice wee crackle, and I think that the McGann David Arnold theme just lends itself perfectly to vinyl release with a little bit of crackle on it. Kenny, I... I congratulate you uh, on Sheridan Smith not being in any release for this year, but you got to mention her anyway. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> of course you did. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, I, and I would recommend anyone who uh, hasn't tested the waters in terms of Time Lord Victorious, uh, the Big Finish audios are great, but I would also recommend uh, some other media that comes with that. Get the two novels as well. Yep. Uh, particularly uh, All Flesh is Grass. That one ties everything up very nicely, uh, gives you a much bigger picture where these all these stories are are on the one canvas, but uh, the novels are pretty easy, pretty easy reads, uh, but it just ties everything up nicely, I think. That, that's, I appreciated that much better when I, when I uh, read the novels. Yep, I didn't name her in person. Catherine Drysdale, I didn't actually name it as the actress because she's in Two Pints yep. of Lager and Back to Chris was Sheridan. Yep. Also got to say, you guys really enjoyed your thoughts on Time Lord Victorious, the audios. So I've been tuning in and listening to those elsewhere and around the console. So yes, I've thoroughly enjoyed your your thoughts and interjections. So yes, so thank you for those. Yeah, it's fun to do. We'll that reminds me, we've, we've got to do Minds of Magnos very soon. <laughs> Magnos. All right, who are we up to? All right, Philip, what about you for the month of April? What stood out to you? Oh, what an amazing month this was, because there was so much stuff, actually. I was very... The, the, the um, Dalek universe started, but I'm going to sort of talk about it later, so I'll, I'll jump in later with, with the last one. But Tom Baker's first Dalek universe was brilliant as well. But I'm going to go a bit, a bit more out there uh, in terms of go for the Avengers. So one of the TV shows that I used to watch with my dad... Uh, was the Avengers, and even even still, every Thursday night at about 2 a.m. in the morning, um, Diana Rigg and Patrick McNee are on in the colour. Just the one, they only show the one season over and over again. The fifth season, I think, which was the fifth, must be the sixth season. Well, the fifth uh, was the first colour one, wasn't it? Yeah, first the first colour season. First colour, yep. And they just play it over and over again, but it's on. It's been on for years at 2 a.m. 
And I still occasionally record it. But I mean, I, I own them all. And I actually just bought the Tara. Actually, because of this release, I bought the box set. Because the ones, I had everything except for the Tara release. So, yeah, Steed and Tara King came out this month. And as I said, I, there's the one Tara King episode you have in the Forget Me Not, which is Diana Riggs' last episode. But it's as much a, a Tara King episode as it is a Diana Riggs episode. But everything's just getting crazy and crazier by that that final Diana Riggs series. And so I got the box set of Tara King and it really goes crazy. <laughs> the show is just bizarre, um, which is, I love. I, 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 it's like nothing else. And these audios capture that whole idea. And so um, I've been getting the, the Avengers strips from for ages. Um, Julian Wadham is playing John Steed. He's done it throughout the different seasons. Um, but Emily Woodward is now playing Tara King. Um, it's not, is it Tara King? She hasn't quite got Tara King's voice, but she's not trying to do that. But in terms of the essence of who Tara King is, she really gets that. Uh, and then Christopher Benjamin's playing Mother. And so anything Christopher Benjamin's in is just hilarious. Mother is the most bizarre character. Um, and yeah. no spoilers, but really it's, it's worth, it's worth the whole, all the episodes are worth just for Christopher Benjamin because he's just having a scream. And one of the things I love is, on the TV show stories, Tara King was originally, originally played by Linda Thorson, and they've actually got her coming back to play a villain. And she's unrecognisable. She's putting on an accent. Um, you know, one of the things that the Avengers does is the most atrocious accents somewhere, probably Eastern European, but it's so bizarre that it's not supposed to be anything proper. Um, it's sort of a low, a low kind of comedy character baddies. Um, but yeah, they're, they're just, just really well done. Um, so John Dorney, uh, did the first one and anything John Dorney does, he just has a passion with it. Um, Dan Starkey is actually in one, but also he, he writes one, which is How Does Your Garden Grow, which is just bizarre as, uh, Roland Moore does another one. And then Sarah Kochala, actually, I don't think I pronounced her name right. Sarah Kochala. Grocola. Oh, so what is it? Grocola. Grocola. So, yep. Yeah. So I don't really know Sarah's stuff, but her her episode of Mother's Day is really great. So the four episodes all have to bring something different and unique. They're all crazy as, but they make a lot of sense. The sound design is 60s brilliant. Um, it's just so well done. The music is spot on. It just feels like the real show. So I can't, can't more highly recommend them. Um, really, really worth getting hold of. So Jamie Roberts did the music and the sound design too. So well, brilliant. Get them. Excellent. I agree. It's brilliant. But, but but like nothing else. I mean, it's it's like no other range. So yeah, I can't, I can't say if you like this, you'll like it because if you like the Avengers, you'll love it. Um, but it's really worth giving it a go. And this is a because it's a, you can just drop into this this box set fine. You don't have to listen to the previous ones. You'll pick it up perfectly from episode one. Yeah, that's what I did. I've not got all the Avengers box sets myself, but I did jump into this one because I was, I'm actually still, I haven't got through it yet, but I'm still on series six. So I was very interested when Linda Thorson uh, was announced as, as guesting on there. So um, I got it for that and yeah, very pleasantly surprised as I always am when, with anything Big Finish does really. The, so I think that's just that the comics from Avengers are fun. If you, the, the original first I forget how many box sets the other uh, original Avengers, which is all based out of season one. There's some season one episodes and written that style. I think it might be seven box sets originally. Seven box sets, yep. Um, that that is a very different feel. That that is sixties black and white spy drama, and it feels like it. I mean, once again, really worth having. There's still little twists and quirks in terms of characterizations. There's still often unknown European countries who are the baddies, um, assassination plots. But it's not like these. These comic strip adventures, once it gets to Tyra King and Dada Rig, it goes crazy. So what about you, Dwayne? What have you listened to in this month? Well, a, a surprising favourite of mine from the month of April. Well, maybe not surprising, but, you know, there's lots of critics of uh, of Big Finish out there that say, oh, another spin-off. They're doing something else. And oh, that really drives me bonkers when people say that because they've never even heard them. So I think people should hear them before they say things like that. And this is one of those ones that would get that kind of criticism before it was even released. Uh, the Lone Centurion. So chronicling the life of uh, 
uh, one of my favourite companions from the new series, um, Rory, played by Arthur Darvill. And it is absolutely incredible. It's a laugh a minute. And the stories, let me just see who the stories are written by. Um, okay, yeah, th three, two good, two writers that I was very familiar with, um, Jack Rayner and David Llewellyn. So I thought I saw them. You go, yep, okay. But the one, the episode that stood out to me was the one written by Sarah Ward, who I'd never seen write too much before. I think I'd seen, just before that, I'd seen a short trip, perhaps, written by Sarah Ward. Uh, she wrote an episode called The Unwilling Assassin. And that's all about Rory uh, being assigned to, to kill people and uh, doing everything he can to get out of it. And it was just one of the best pieces of entertainment. I was chuckling all the way through this. And by the end of it, I was so into this that uh, I thought, is the next one coming out next month? Um, it, was, it was that good. So for me, the standout uh, for April is uh, The Lone Centurion. And I think Arthur Darvill is such a, such a quirky guy anyway. He, he injects his own brand of quirkiness into this, and it just, it's magical. It's magical. Don't know what you guys thought. Loved it. I thought it was one of the funniest releases of the year. Very understated. I would have actually probably picked this one, but you nicked it. So <laughs> I'll let you have it. You're the boss. And uh, yeah, I, I thought it was great. Just so much fun throughout it. Arthur Darvill, absolutely engaging and wonderful character. I, like you, I'm a big fan of him. Rory, one of my favourite 21st century companions. So just everyday guy caught up in a mad, crazy world. Yeah, it's stunning, stunning production, brilliantly done. Very good. Let's move on and we'll go to May. Now this, Kenny, this was a big month, wasn't it? It was huge. This is one that I think we'd all been looking forward to since the previous autumn with the arrival of the Ninth Doctor on audio in Ravagers by Nicholas Briggs. I think that we, let's be honest, we probably never thought this would happen, that we'd get Ninth Doctor Adventures starring Chris Eccleston, given the way things worked out for him on TV. We know that he didn't have the happiest of times working on the show, but then to find him on audio and absolutely relishing it, the fact that he's thrown himself into it wholeheartedly, he's been involved with the scripts and the content and things like that, and here we go, we've got him back. And it was just such an incredible feeling, just that opening opening couple of minutes when we hear him, he's in the TARDIS, the adventure is already underway, and of course we do get flashbacks just to explain what's going on. And it's just incredible just to hear him. And it's, I actually had to listen to the whole thing twice, particularly, in fact, I think I did listen to the first episode three times just to take it all in because I was still in that, this is Christopher Eccleston doing Doctor Who again. And... And it's a very, very complex story to get underway, but I think that's what Chris wanted. He wanted something that wasn't going to be an easy, oh, here's the Doctor, here he is, going about, having fun adventures. And the fact that there's quite a quite a hard edge to it and good sci-fi um, angles to it and just gives you something to really sink your teeth into. And it is definitely worth the repeated listens just to go over the fact that you've got Christopher Eccleston in your ears once more as the Doctor, and he's definitely having a ball. And considering this is the the first one he'd done, it's quite incredible because he absolutely finds that rhythm from the word go, getting those laughs in there. And just, yeah, I, I just love it. I'm just so, so pleased that Christopher Eccleston is back in our lives as the Doctor once more. Yeah. The, th the thing I appreciate the show is Big Finish doesn't just play things safe. It could have gone nice and safe in terms of, you know, a story set in the present, story set in the future, story set in the past, um, following the traditional what the what Russell set up in the original series. So, no, we'll go a bit more radical. We're going to choose a story which is unbelievably complex over three stories, backwards and forth, and you, it's going to really pay you to listen again and again. So, yeah, extra value because you've got, you've got to listen several times, but it's through some people, but boy, it's been worthwhile. You've got, to keep, a lifetime. you've got to keep in mind that this, uh, now I saw another reviewer make this point, so this doesn't come from me, but it made a lot of sense. This is the first time we've ever seen the Ninth Doctor outside of the uh, production influence of Russell T Davies, the very first time. So it's, it's 
exciting that we that we have that we get to see the ninth doctor separately but when when i heard it i found it a little bit complicated myself to listen to uh i'm i'm not so much in i'm more into the character stuff not the timey-wimey stuff so much however as far as the character of the ninth doctor goes it's like he's never been away it, it, it that's what blew my mind about this it was like this is the ninth doctor that captured everybody's hearts back in 2005 exactly as he was back then with this fantastic new story and you know new production whatever on audio but i could visualize everything and it was uh it was absolutely beautiful to to hear chris eccleston sounding like he was enjoying himself and after hearing what we've heard about how he didn't enjoy himself and you know, even some people uh, were criticizing some of his interviews, saying, oh, I wasn't very exuberant, but he certainly let loose for the for the uh, for the production side of it. It was uh, it was like he'd never never been away. So that's what I appreciated from from that particular release. OK, can you may know this, but I suspect Russell T did at least have a look over the scripts beforehand. Because I, I think he keeps his hand into everything that's happened from his era. Is that fair to say? Can you know? I genuinely have no idea if that's the case or not. I really don't know. Okay. Good. Oh, we'll find out sometime, somehow. It wouldn't surprise me if he did, but he's a little bit further removed than... Mm. Like, oh, he's, def- not, def- he's not responsible for it at the end of the day, really. No. Well, it's the first one uh, he didn't write, certainly. He didn't write this for yeah. Chris. And all the others, he would have had a major hand in writing bar the... Um, Stephen Moffat one, ones. Absolutely. Yeah, good stuff. And there was more to come. Mm. Much more to come. Uh, Philip, another new series that uh, that we got to experience that month. Uh, you picked a, new- well, I, a newbie. Well, kind of a newbie in yeah. terms of... Yeah, well, <laughs> the, the, the worlds of Blake 7. Um, I guess... New format. Tr- new format. When we, when we tragically lost Paul Darrow, I think many of us thought that was it. There'd be no more. You know, we lost we lost Gareth. We lost, lost Paul. We lost Jackie. We just lost too many people to, in some ways, to feel like the show could go on. I was kind of hoping they might go back to the uh, Liberator Chronicle styles. So I love, I love the Chronicles, it, be, be what they are, and so that's what I thought they'd go back to. But they actually came up with a style which I wasn't expecting, which was they found ways of tapping into the show history and bringing in just one or two of the original cast, but also gives new ones. And so this is the first. This is the first of the new worlds of Blake Seven, Avalon which, of course, is a character that appears in uh, a Blake 7 episode from Season 1 called Project Avalon. Um, when we meet her there, it's Jenna already knows her, and so it's natural that you you bring Jenna into the first episode. So, once again, three amazing episodes. Uh, we get Sally in a vet at the as Jenna and her youngest, and we actually find out how she was captured and how she first met Blake, because at the end of her episode, that's what happens. So, in terms of getting set up for the show to start, so this is set just before Blake 7. We have Gary Russell's returned as an author. It's been a long time since he's been writing for Big Finish, and he has come back as a powerhouse. So Throwback is just mainly two characters. There's a third one as well, but it really focuses on Stephen Greif and an interrogation scene, and it is just brilliantly constructed. So Gary Russell has just written this beautiful piece of work. Um, and then finally Black Waters by Trevor Baxendale. So three really great stories, and there's going to be another box set with other Avalon adventures along the way. But just really, really, really clever. I think Peter... Let me just double-check myself. I'm pretty sure it's Peter Angelius. Is the one that's constructed all this? That's the one. Yeah, good. If I pronounce his name properly, Kenny. You... Angelides. Angelides. Um, so he's, he's, it's his, his brain work, his, his powers, putting it all together... There's been a few box sets. I'm going to mention another one later. But if you're into Blake Seven, or if you're not into Blake Seven, listen to these because you will become so. But anyone who loves Blake Seven, it's just marvelous. And yeah, we've got a chat. We've got a chance to chat with both Sally and Stephen throughout the course of the year. They're excited to be back, and they just bring so much to their roles. Very excited. So I mean, I, yeah, after Doctor Who, Blake Seven is certainly my big, big passion. And so it's, it's, yeah, I'm so excited that what Big Finish has done. And hopefully we'll have, you know, many more years and the cast will survive a bit longer. What about you, Dwayne? What's your pick for May? 
Uh, I want to choose a, a story from a box set. It's from, although I should shout out to the other story as well, it's the Third Doctor Adventures Volume 7. Uh, there's two stories on there, the Unzal Incursion, uh, featuring Daisy Ashford as Liz, and The Golf, featuring uh, Sadie Miller as Sarah Jane Smith. Now, what was good about The Golf was the fact that Sadie got a lot more to do than she did in uh, Return of the Cybermen earlier on. We'd already had a taste of what Sadie could do as Sarah Jane, and she was really coming into, into her own in this one. Um, so I enjoyed the golf for, for, for Sadie's performance. Uh, well, everything, but the, Sadie stood out to me. Um, as far as the Unzal incursion goes, I, I, I said at the outset that uh, John Pertwee was, was my doctor, and particularly Season 7. Uh, so anything that Big Finish does that harks back to Season 7 uh, is a winner for me, and this one just took me right back. It was nice to see... Nick Briggs and uh, Benji Clifford working together on the sound because uh, we, we often hear them in the podcast. Uh, it's not too often that they work together. And um, yeah, so so Nick uh, was on music, Benji was on sound. And this is one of those stories where you really get a good... If you're a fan of an era and you can pick up what the sound designers are doing to recreate that era in your mind and they do it well, this is what sells Big Finish to me. Uh it is that that sound design at the end. Story was fantastic too. Uh, interesting concept there. Um, with we had a female sergeant coming in as well. Uh, it, it was a different, were different from what we would have got in season seven. Um, and but overall, the, it's the sound that stood out to me. I mean, that's what Big Finish is all about, isn't it? It's all about sound. So uh, that's what I that's what I love about that one. Um, I think we had another Third Doctor Adventures later in the year, and we've got uh, a Third Doctor Adventure coming up very soon. So I'm always excited to to hear what they do with these. And uh, I just want to give a shout out to Nick and Benji for, for what they did on that particular release. It blew me away. Mm. Yeah, the Third Doctor one sounds so authentic. Getting that radiophonic workshop sound is something, I know something that Nick absolutely loves doing, and he just gets it. Absolutely perfectly. A bit of Malcolm Clark, a bit of Dudley Simpson. Yeah, on the nose. It's perfect. Love it. Absolutely. Okay. What are we up to, boys? Are we up to June? Almost half. Right. Almost halfway month. there. Okay. <laughs> let's uh let's throw over to you, Kenny. What did you go for for June? This was a really tough month to choose from because there were so many great releases. I mean, it literally there was which I was thinking which one made me laugh the most and that was what ultimately got me to choose the five people you kill in Middlesbrough which is a town in northeast England and it's got a bit of an industrial sort of heritage and he here we've got a story which has got Tracy Ann Oberman at the heart of it as Yvonne Hartman and there's an alien spaceship crash there and pretty much she goes around ensuring that it is, is basically a typical torture job, trying to cover up what's happened. But she finds a few problems along the way. And it's just wonderfully done, written apparently by the character herself, not Tracy Ann, but actually written by Yvonne, which is a nice touch. But I think it's very much Tracy Ann and James Goss working together with an idea and spinning it off. And it is just so funny. I, it just made me laugh throughout and she goes around pretty much having anybody who gets in her way wiped out to try and cover up the fact there's a crashed alien spaceship spouting radiation that will kill everybody. And it, it's just a wonderful release, very subtly funny and great cast in it as well. We've got Dennis Lawson showing up, Wedge and Tilly's in Star Wars, and who I actually once saw in Glasgow wondering about looking at a street puppet show. Um, of course she did. Yeah, I didn't go because it, was, it wasn't actually the night of the big five million get together, chase the haggis and drink whiskey and catch up and drink iron brew as well. Um, yeah, I just think it's a fab story. And if you haven't heard it, it's just it's, it's so funny. I'd hugely recommend it. I think particularly if you understand the political situation in Great Britain at the moment, it has a lot more bite to it. So, I mean, you know, yeah. out in Australia, we do follow a lot on Twitter. And, you know, to say Doctor Who Connections, we hear a lot about what's going on over there. And I think a lot of the 
a lot of the comments were very biting towards the current situation yep. and politicians and how people react. And yeah, I laughed and laughed. It was, as I said, Torchwood the whole year has just been amazing. Yeah, definitely agree. Okay, Philip, what about you? Uh, yeah, well, I'm going to go. There was once again. There's lots I could have gone for, but I'm going to go. Was this the month that Dalek uh, Universe started as well? No, no, that was, was that previous. That was previously. I did. I mentioned it last. I mentioned it before. Um, so that started, I think, last month. Um, I'm going to mention the robots. So I have just adored this season once again. You know, people criticise the spin-offs too far, but Nicola Walker. Anything you can have her in, it's worth listening to. What an amazing actress! I still get blown away that you have a British icon like Nicola Walker, who is just the powerhouse of acting over there in amazing series and big finish have her. And it's, it's amazing enough that she does the eighth doctor stuff, but this spin-off series with the robots has just been amazing. Um, her and Claire Rushbrook together as sisters exploring the world of Caldor. It is just so rich and so powerful and it just gets more and more intriguing um, originally it was supposed to be four box sets. This is the fourth box set. There's another two, thank goodness. But just seeing what they've done. And then this is, of course, David Collins's final work before he passed away, um, which is a bit tragic because he's it's just marvellous and wonderful. And, of course, Pamela Salem, who, who's been a huge crush of mine since I was about 10 years old and saw her in Robots of Death. Um, she's still a huge crush of mine, i got to be honest. And just, you know, once again, seeing what's happened with her character and what they've been doing with her, very clever. Not what I expected. There was a lovely twist in this in the last box set, and I'm looking forward to seeing where it goes to from here. And um, I'm, I'm assuming this issue isn't just in terms of recording um, and being able to get all the cast together, which is why I think the delays happen. I don't know that, but you know, when we spoke to Pamela Salem, she's not particularly technically savvy, and I assume they're having some issues with um, you know, just travel and being able to record her to do her parts. One thing that concerned me about the robots, and we spoke about it with John Dorney himself, because I'm a huge fan of the Caldor City uh, series as well. And uh, I asked John, have you listened to Caldor City to make sure it doesn't cross over? Because, uh, you know, it's a really solid story, that Caldor City story, which is a, not a big finished production. And um, he said he'd never heard it. So I think uh, I think it might have been in the series before that ended on a cliffhanger. And I thought, oh no, they're getting very close to 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 crossing over into the Caldor City and sort of changing that all together. But then they backed away from it again. So uh, I was I was happy that they didn't cross the line. And Caldor City is still uh, canon. still canon in my head anyway. <laughs> I don't know about anyone else's. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, that's what I liked about that is they didn't cross that line. They haven't yet. Anyway, no. let's see. What's your pick for this month, Dwayne? Okay, I, I changed my original pick, so I'm going to give an honourable mention to Jago and Lightfoot Series 14, the audio book release, because um, uh, I, was in, I was in hospital recently, and so I had a big chunk of time to kill, so I was laying there with my headphones on, getting interrupted every half an hour by nurses. It was very annoying, or well, they were probably annoyed by me, but I was able to get through the whole 14 or so hours. Was it 14 hours? I think it's about 12 or 14 hours of Jago and Lightfoot series 14. Uh, because you remember when we talked to Paul Morris, Philip, um, a little while back, a bit over 12 months ago, that a series 14 was written. And uh, we, we did say, oh, that's a shame. Uh, do, do you think anything might be done with, might be done with it? And he sort of, uh, his, his lips kind of went a bit tight. And, and uh, he would have been working on it at the time, uh, this audiobook series. So... Uh, they turned series 14 into a series of audiobooks. And I've got to say that the all the actors that they've got, I can't remember the name of the first two two actors, but everyone who reads one of the books was involved in the Jago and Lightfoot series somewhere. So Christopher Benjamin reads the last one, Lisa Bauman reads the second last one, and the first two are, are read by some amazing actors. And I wish I could remember their names. Is I Duncan got... Wisby? Is Duncan Wisby one Duncan of them? was one of them. Uh, and I and can't remember the, the other the gentleman one. gentleman who plays Aubrey. Yes. Yes. Jimmy, what? Jimmy something? Can't remember. Sorry, I can't remember. They, they did such an amazing job. I, the 14 hours didn't seem like it was 14 hours. However, I can imagine it, it did take me a while to... I, I, this was one I was putting on the back burner because other releases keep coming out and you've got to invest a lot of time into these audiobooks. 
But when I did, when I did invest that time, absolutely incredible uh, story. And the story, uh, story arc was great. It was virtually one continuous story for the whole season. So started off one way, the different different scenarios in each episode, but it was the one single story that concluded in the last one. So Kenny, what did you have to say about that? Jamie Newell, that's the other Jamie reader. Newell. Yeah. He's the one. He's the one that blew me away with his uh, uh, to put him first on the on the set. Uh, by the time I'd finished listening to him, it was just wow, this guy's amazing. So uh, yeah, highly recommend, highly recommend Jay One Lightfoot. But that was my honourable mention. The one that I should mention is the one that many of us Doctor Who fans were waiting for, and that was the War Doctor Begins. So this was a an interesting recasting of uh, of a doctor that that was kind of we thought could it be done and then Jonathan Carley comes along and this set was directed by Louise Jameson and he just absolutely you, it's hard to tell the difference between John Hurt and Jonathan Carley I don't know if you guys agree with me there but it's just mm. it's absolutely uncanny I mean the only other person that that does uh, impressions like this would be John Coleshaw when he does things like the Brigadier. Um, but Jonathan is just such a talented guy when it comes to recreating this voice. And the stories were amazing too. And what I loved about this that were that the it took it where it started were exactly at the same point where uh, Night of the Doctor left off. So that regeneration scene, it goes immediately seconds after that. That's where it all begins. And I I loved that. Three great stories, Matt Fitton. Starts it off, we've got, of course, reliable Matt Fitton doing the first story. And this was probably the first time in 21 where Helen Goldwyn stood out to me as uh, as a character. Uh, she's been acting for Big Finish for years, but doing a lot more directing lately. But the, she had a great character part in this that I really loved, playing playing a bit of a villain, a villainous Time Lord. And I, I love that. And this was the first of a few different appearances of Helen Goldwyn throughout the year that stood out to me. Um, but yeah, and the second one has only recently been released, which I haven't, I've only heard the first one. I haven't heard the whole set of the second series yet. Uh, but Lou Morgan was the other writer, Andrew Smith. So really good, solid writers. Lou Morgan, we're going to talk about more because she did some absolutely mind blowing stuff. But this is, this is one of her earlier stories, uh, featuring the Tharrells as well. Uh, so a, a really, really enjoyable set. And I think this one's going to go on for quite some time. What do you guys think? Yeah, I think, once again, it's been amazingly done. I think the way he captured um, John Hurt so well was so powerful. And, yeah, they're just really great stories. It, it started slow, but, boy, it was a powerhouse in terms of how it built up. And the potential this has to really show the degeneration of that Doctor um, is, I think, a yeah, really, really great opportunity. I think that got, that got me about um, the actor's performance was I just know I know Louise worked very hard with this. They spent just a day in rehearsals together, um, just the two of them in a hall rehearsing. And the thing about anything that Lou directs is she has this way of um, characters pausing and giving weight through pause. And there was one of the things that really came through at this whole production is in terms of it, it lifted to it like a Shakespearean level, and that's you know lose passion and so the, the the whole works became almost Shakespearean in terms of the storytelling and so the gravitas became more serious the power of these you know these lines that these that these writers had written took on a whole new form and shape so yeah I was enthralled by the whole set and as I said, I've been actually I haven't listened to the second box set it's been sitting there but I want to have a decent time with no children nearby to listen to it so that's that's my goal yeah, you know, I really enjoyed it too. I think that, as you said, Jonathan has done an incredible job and it's not just an impression, it is a proper performance. It just so happens that he's acting and using the voice of another actor, but he's so good at it. He's so invested. It's just fantastic. Lou Jameson's done a wonderful job with him to actually get him to be able to do the voice for a long time rather than have to do it in short bursts. I mean, I don't know if you guys ever watched Inspector Gadget, the cartoon. Absolutely. Because I can do the yeah. voice of Dr. Claw. I'll get you next time, Gadget. Silence, Mad Cat. It also works as a Jadoon if you pitch it a little bit up here. And, go for show blow, go for. <laughs> and that actually knackers the throat very quickly. And I'd imagine that by doing 
John Hurt's voice, that getting that gravelly sound. Edward Nackram, but Lou's worked with him very hard. Great, really good box set. I think Matt's opener was fantastic. Lou's done a great job with the Thanos, yeah. and then Andy's script with the Doctor going directly for the time controller. Fabulous. I mean, for me, this really was a box of delights. Yeah. From Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, The Ninth Doctor Adventures, Volume 1, Ravagers. I'm back! I'm really back in the TARDIS! You did it, old girl! Endless possibilities and events. Future, past, and everything in between. I have done the thing! Temporal thing radiating from the TARDIS like nobody's business. Doctor, I honestly don't know how this could have happened. Come on, get in! Oh my god! It's alright! It's alright! Don't panic! I'm not panicking! I wasn't talking to you! Centurion! Did you just fall out of the sky or something? So? Yeah. So you lied to her. I meant what I said. Doctor! If you can hear me, you better get here soon! Run for it, lads! Run! But if you stay here, waving your swords and spears around, you'll be blown off the face of the earth! That macho enough for you? He's really done it now. Nova! Yeah? Hang on to something! Sir! Stop this! I couldn't agree more, Doctor. Audrey, no! Put that gun! How can this be inside your police box? Perfectly reasonable question. Sergeant! We're being overrun! We've got to withdraw! That sounded a bit polite for a giant mechanical monster. Oh, God, no idea, sir. Who the hell are these people? Just Just quiet, please, all of you! Sort of terrifying. Pretty much sums it up. What if they grab you and try to wipe your brain? They can try! Right. Shall we get on with this? That's not just amazing, it's... Fantastic! Big Finish. We love stories. That was a very, very good segue there. Kenny, we're we're into the month of July, halfway there. Yeah, you'd almost think I'd done this sort of thing before, wouldn't you? But yes, my choice for July was The Box of Delights, which I don't know if you guys got that in the 80s, but it was a huge production uh, over here in the UK when the BBC did a version of it with Patrick Troughton as Cole Hollings, the the mysterious Punch and Judy man. And this was a, a massive thing in our house. We loved this show. My dad had been a fan of the book when he was a young fella. And so when this became a TV version, really excited by it. Myself and my sister would watch it and it ended you know, over and over every year. We had it recorded in our video. So when it was announced Big Finish were doing an audio version, I was so excited because this was such an important part of my childhood. And listening to it, I was just absolutely blown away. I actually get quite emotional in places because my dad, he's been gone nearly 20 years now. And I know he would have absolutely have loved this. And it was just it just took me back to being 10 years old again and just in a very happy place. It's brilliantly done, superb cast. What Barnaby Edwards has done with it is just incredible. Um, just to to make it work as an audio production, because it's something that's quite visual, particularly when you're reading the book. And some wee changes here and there, which they make clear uh, I don't know why they've done it, and it makes perfect sense. So yeah, and it's it's just a wonderful, joyous, fantastic release. But it may have been released in July, but I actually kept it until the start of December because I wanted to get that Christmas feeling. And uh, there's 10 episodes and I was doing, I only planned to do one a day, but I ended up doing two and three in a day and, and got it all done in about four days, I think, in, in total. And it's just a magical release. You've got, so Derek Jacobi playing Patrick Troughton's role and he's just, it's just perfect for it. He's got that warmth and charm. And I, I was more in more recent, more recent years, I've been used to him as the voice of In the Night Garden, which my daughter used to watch and love. And just to hear him play this part with such warmth, I've been more used to the War Master in my ears. It's just an incredible release. I would hugely recommend it to anyone. And perhaps for you guys, maybe hold on, if you haven't heard it yet, hang on until June when it hits winter for you, and then it will just be magical. It still, it still won't snow. <laughs> well, I'm in Tasmania. Winter starts in April. Compared to Sydney, anyway. <laughs> yeah, true. Have you heard it? Yeah, uh, winter ends in Scotland in June. 
Have you heard it, Philip? No, I must confess, I've got it. I just, it was one of the ones I didn't get to. If I, I struggle, if I don't get to it at the time, um, often I struggle to find a, a space to put it. So it's one of the ones that have been sitting there on the back burner. And I keep hearing amazing things about it. And my intention was to listen to it before Christmas. And then Christmas came and went and I've missed it. So, But I will get to it because I, I, mean, I, I adore Derek Jacobi. And so, yeah, really want to hear it. I did actually email Barney afterwards just to say thank you for doing it because I know my dad would have loved it. And it sort of made me think of my mum and dad a lot in a, in a lovely, happy, warm way and run up to Christmas. So I would definitely recommend it. Cool. All right, Philip. What yeah, about well, you for July? July. I, I like choosing things that you know, are out there slightly that other people aren't listening to. And so I'm going to choose Sherlock Holmes. It's the uh, been a long time since uh, we had a Sherlock Holmes release from Big Finish. So this was the seamstress of Peckham Rye. Uh, I just adore Nicholas Briggs as Sherlock. So once again, this is one of the one of those series that Big Finish tricked me into. They gave me a free episode, which is still available. Which was the dastardly they are. N- n- yes, they are the serpent one. Um, oh, we should, should we call that whatever. Um, yeah, don't give it away. They've got free episodes. Go and find it, and um, yeah, listen to the free episode. Thought Nicholas Briggs was amazing, but more more recently, Jonathan Barnes has been writing box sets original dramas and they are spectacular so he just jonathan jonathan um barnes has this way of writing for sherlock in this how do you describe it it's a, a modern take in terms of a lot of the thinking behind the character but very very clever twisted plots and so Simpson peck and rye has a couple of different stories happen at the same time and then towards the end you realize no no they actually are all interlinked um, I, Richard Earl is an amazing Watson to, to Nicholas Briggs' Sherlock Holmes, but he's also got Lucy Briggs Owens, who is just amazing in this. Uh, India Fisher, who I adore as well, and then James Joyce. So it's got a cast of big finished names that they you know, pull them all in. Um, Ken Bentley's directing, and you always know anything Ken does is going to be sensible and put together really well, and he just knows how to whack together an audio that just works and just everything about this production works i just yeah once again victorian period i love the way actually it probably is victorian it's probably after victorian i don't know sorry those english people so great british people with your history you understand your kings and queens better than i do it's after i don't know yeah so after victoria whoever's next <laughs> um Edward the Seventh, I believe. So Edwardian. So Edwardian. Maybe, I, Victorian I'm, I'm Edwardian. To, I'm, I'm trying to work as Edwardian, I don't know. Whenever it's set, it's it's late in late in Sherlock Holmes' life, but it's just you know, it's it still conjures all those Victorian images in terms of London at that time. So really worth listening to. If you love Sherlock Holmes, it's great. Modern Tales is not Conan Doyle, but really worth a listen to. And I love it when Nicholas Briggs gets to act. Because he's a great actor who, you know, we, we recognise as the Daleks and things, which is still great acting, don't get me wrong. I still think all those that voice work he does is strong and important acting and he holds stuff together by, by being good. But when he gets to play a major role, wow. I must say, I did get that. I think there was a pair of releases. This is the first one, there's another one yet to come. Uh, that's right. I've bought because them, about a year, early, a year before this was released, I think they announced it. And put in this mega, mega special deal. So I thought, I can't, I can't resist that. So I, I got them. And that's dropped. I haven't heard all of it yet. But uh, I have started on it. Hmm. No, and the mega deal was a mistake by mistake. We actually, because I, I did the same thing. I thought, boy, that's a really great price for those two releases on Borders. And it was supposed to have only been for the first release. And by mistake, they would bundled them together. So oh, really? Those, those of us who jumped in really fast and ah. got both of them have actually got it for half, more less than half price. Ah, because, subscribe uh, to the Big Finish newsletter. You'll get you'll get uh, onto these. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. so don't, don't know whose blunder that was, but thank you because I'm gonna I'm looking forward to the second part. Big Finish, we love bargains. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> they're hard and to resist. Sure, and make sure, guys, yeah, go to the Big Finish website at the moment because with all the Christmas bargains that are happening, and by the time when this episode drops, there'll be another day or two of bargains. And usually, and I'm sure they'll do it again. They do all 12 bargains wrapped up into one at the very end. So there's been some free giveaways. There's been some really great deals. If you need to play, plug some gaps, 
really encourage you get get onto the website today. I believe Anyhow, you. Get some bargains because it's worth it. What about you, Dwayne? What are you choosing for this? My choice for July, I've got two. Sorry, guys, but I'm allowed. Uh, I'm going to give an honourable mention to Scourge of the Cybermen. That was one that I originally picked because I've... I No, I listened to it at the time. I listened to it at the time. Um, after Terror of the Master, this was the first full-length audio novel. So we've got an audio novels range that's just started. Big finish. The next one's coming out this month, actually. Uh, Matthew Waterhouse's uh, The Watchers, I think it's called. Um, but Scourge of the Cybermen, once again, read by John Colshaw. Amazing. Third Doctor, Sarah Jane Smith. Boy, he does Sarah Jane well. It's amazing. It's it's uncanny how he how he gets all those inflections just right. It is very long, so uh, you've got to give yourself seven, eight hours to get through it. But each episode, if you think each, it's a six-parter, uh, but each episode is read, and they go for about an hour and a quarter to an hour and a half each. So if you look at it that way, you can break it down a little bit and get through it a bit easier. But I would highly recommend Scourge of the Cybermen. Blew me away. Uh, great story. Uh, great feel of the Third Doctor. That Series 11 feel is there. Uh, really good stuff. But the one that I picked that I cannot fail to mention is Lady Christina, Series 2. Now, you said Pamela Salem was a bit of a crush of yours, uh, Philip. Um, oh, I've got a mental blank now. Michelle Ryan, she's a, a bit of a crush of mine too, ever since I saw her in uh, Bionic Woman, I think it was. Love that show. Shame it didn't get a uh, full series, but anyway. Um, love Michelle Ryan to Be start with. Be young for you, Dwayne. No, oh, no, no. It's all the rage. Um, <laughs> well, how old do you think I am, Philip? Yeah, anyway, uh, what's what's great about this series is that it's a little bit different to other seri series, like the Rory series was a full-on comedy. Um, the... The Jenny series that was to come later on in the year was a, was had a little bit of a different feel, but I loved the fact that well, I think the thing that I liked the most about this oh great guest performance by Sean Phillips by the way she was amazing playing Lady Christina's aunt I love that episode set in Australia too Western Australia uh, and I always I'm always a sucker for stories that are set here so um, the thing that I loved about the the characterization of Christina is that they're able to have a strong female character but still keep her with all the feminine sexy qualities she doesn't have to lose that to still be like they, they don't have to turn her into a masculine figure she can still be a woman still be very powerful uh but still have those feminine qualities that's what i love about uh christina and i hope there's many many more of these to come because uh there's one other thing i love about this too i can't remember if it's Joe Kramer that does the music for this. Is it Joe Kenny? Do you remember? Is it, it is. Um, I love the theme uh, that he's done for for Christina with the electric guitar in there. I love my electric guitar. One day, Philip, they'll do a musical theatre theme for somebody. Um, but I love the themes with the electric, the electric guitar. Does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For one. Um, and the, uh, the Pirates? No? Pirates. The yeah, Pirates is another one. Yeah. Uh, I think Jenny, the Jenny theme's got electric guitar in there too. So the girls always get the electric guitar. It's really awesome. Um, so the the music, sound design, character, character, character. That's what this box set is full of. And uh, it is something that I, I turn to when I turn on the TV and I see shows on TV that are so boring and without any character. Uh, this is what I turn to. So fantastic. I've, I've thumbs up for this one for... For, and I hope there's I hope there's much more to come. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Let's move on to August. Uh, okay, let's go to Kenny. What have you got for August for us? Well, when whenever I get uh, an email from the Sirens of Audio asking me to come on, I will respond to all calls. And my choice for this one is Girl Deconstructed from the, the second night of the book set, which is... A story that coincidentally happens to be set in Dundee in Scotland. And just like yourself, I'm always interested when there's a story set in my home country. Obviously, you had Australia there with Lady Christina. So I've got Scotland for this one. And it's a marvellous tale. It's one that 
is written by Lisa McMillan and it's based on an idea. The inspiration for this story by Lisa came from a childhood fear. It's a bit like a touch of a Stephen Moffat there, where she was told in her parents' house not to go near a window because if she did, she would disappear. And obviously her parents were trying to say, you would die because you'd fall out the window. But to her mind, that would be a case of like, she'd disappear and nobody would see her again. And everybody would you know, carry on as normal, but they go, where's Lisa gone? And she took that and turned it into something rather spooky and fantastic and clever. And I absolutely love this one. It's got a really good Scottish cast in it as well. Mirren Mack, who plays the title character of the Deconstructed Girl, is fabulous. She is a rising wee talent in Scotland, and I wouldn't be surprised if we see her in proper Doctor Who in the future. When I say proper, I mean TV. Obviously, Big Finish is proper Doctor Who, but on the big screen Doctor Who, or small screen. She's fabulous, and it's just a wonderful, clever story. I listened to this, and I just fell in love with it very, very quickly. Directed by Helen Goldwyn, and it moves along at some pace. And the fact you've got Chris Eccleston himself saying this would have been perfect to work in TV. In fact, um, I made that into a ringtone for Lisa and sent it to her, who is actually in that house at the moment. Um, and, but she's not falling out the window at the moment because I was texting her last night. And because um, the new becoming on, I just wanted to double check she hadn't fallen through the window and she's safe as we speak. So all is good there. But yeah, another brilliant performance from Eccleston and such a damn good release and it was definitely a really good way of killing time I thought. It was a lovely relationship between father and daughter and the exploration of the difficulties that can happen through teenage years and yeah having teenage daughters at the moment it it certainly uh, got me quite emotional at points. Yeah well Kenny tried to segue to you Philip but uh, you didn't pick up on that. Oh the killing time. Now hang on a second before you start before you start (laughs) I'm just going to take a Valium before you talk about this one, because it's really upsetting. <laughs> no, okay. just kidding. I won't take any. No, I'll try and okay. cope without it. <laughs> I'll, keep, I'll keep it short. Uh, I mean, we have talked a bit in about Killing Time earlier, because it was certainly a, really, at least a It's a standout me. of this year, absolutely. It, it, it was just stunning. Once again, Derek Jacobi, anything he does uh, is astounding. I'm fortunate to see him live on stage on a couple of occasions, and he just holds an audience like nothing else. And even on audio, his voice, his mannerisms, and it doesn't matter what he plays, he's just breathtaking. And coming back as as the War Master has been just such a a highlight. And on the whole, you love him. And I think what surprised me so much with this release was he was despicable and I hated him. And I I don't think I feel like that before. So there's four stories. Story one, story four, uh, James Goss, always reliable, as you can expect. But once again, Lou Morgan. So I don't know. Lou's is a woman. Is it Louise Morgan? It is. Yes. Okay. The two that, the two that Lou Morgan have written have been, were just astounding. So, um, A Quiet Night in and The Orphan, um, with, which bring back, um, Katie Manning and Sarah Sutton. So we get Joe come back, we get Nissa come back. And the master is killing time by just being horrendous for no real reason aside for he wants to be. He kind of has a purpose. There is a purpose linked with episodes one and four of why he's doing it. But he doesn't need to do what he does. And he's just so awful to Joe and so awful to Nissa. That's the first time I've actually really despised the master. Because what he puts them through for his pleasure and for his joy and to fill in time is just astounding. And it is probably too well acted because I was really affected by them both. So both Katie Manning and Sarah Sutton just do stunning performances. When they finally work out who he is, what's going on, what he's doing to them, uh, it's heartbreaking. So if, if you just want to see... Probably the best, I think possibly the best acting performance both Katie Manning and Sarah Sutton have given on Big Finish. I think it's here. And partly I guess it's playing up to Derek Jacoby. When you have an actor of that standard, uh, you know, everybody rises. And what he managed to, to lift those two up to is just astounding because their, their performances are impeccable. And yeah, I'm, st- I'm still devastated by, by what happened in those two stories. Yeah, the, the, the story with Joe in particular 
was 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 pretty incredible. He was doing some nasty, nasty stuff to her. And um, uh, yeah, Katie Manning, she was absolutely sensational in, in this role, and she was putting more into it. Oh, not that she doesn't put hundred percent into it, but she's um, she certainly was being affected herself by the script, uh, which was obvious that came through in the extras on that release as well. And uh, yeah, I was. I was on a very big walk while I was listening to that one. I don't know if anyone knows Launceston, but up in the Cataract Gorge, I was walking around there uh, for the whole episode there. And uh, it usually takes it out of me, but boy, I was exhausted after that, after that one, uh, emotionally as well. It was really, really strong stuff, powerful stuff. Mm. Yeah. Okay, well, now we're depressed. What about you, Dwayne? What were you listening to? So I needed something to, it was a little bit slower uh after after listening to that and this is one that i'd been looking forward to for a long time the secrets of debt sen uh because i do i do enjoy the abominable snowmen even though i have said nasty things about the web of fear before i do like the concept of the of the yeti and particularly the abominable snowmen i like i like the setting so this is a prequel uh to the abominable snowmen with peter purvis and i always love peter's first doctor so like like Fraser playing Jamie and the second doctor this is another uh actor who plays the doctor and companion in the same at the same time um and even though he doesn't sound like William Hartnell it's like William Hartnell was there it's hard to explain he's channeling him uh in um without without actually sounding like him he puts the inflections on it's just uh, just amazing anyway there's a lot of this is written by andy frank amallon who is i think he's uh in charge of candy jar is he in charge of candy jar and they have the rights he to looks after he looks after the sort of the brigadier side of things for the candy jar books yeah okay so yeah so he looks after the rights uh, for that so he he hasn't written too many things before. I think he's written some countermeasures previously. I think he, there was a Yeti story in there that he may have written. Uh, but I really, really enjoyed this one. It is a little bit... Uh, it's a pure historical as well. So the Yeti on the front might be a little bit deceptive. Uh, you may think the Yeti are in there, but it's very interesting the way they have inserted the Yeti in there into this pure historical story. And lots of journeying, lots of talking around, lots of... If you like Marco Polo, I think you're going to like this one because there's lots of tripping around the place. And I think it really uh, leads up to uh, the relationship the Doctor has with one of the characters there leads up very nicely to the Abominable Snowman. And of course, we get to find out what happened to the Holy Gunter, how the second Doctor got that. Um, as you, you know, if you know the story, you're going to assume that that's got something to do with it at some point. So uh, it does. Uh, and I, I just think it's really good. We've got a recast of, of Dodo as well in this one. So we've got another actress playing Dodo there. So that we also, we've, we had a recast for Katarina as well, uh, previously, uh, for around, uh, the same era. Uh, and who's the, who's the actress that plays? Let me just have a look here. Is it Lauren Corne Is it Lauren Cornelius? Lauren Cornelius. Yep, she's the new Dodo. Lauren Co fan. Cornelius. So I think she's fantastic. Does a great job, and I really miss the regularity of these early adventures. I wish there was more, and perhaps there will be when they put out these box sets. Maybe we'll get some of these new adventure style stories in the box sets as they come out this year. We'll wait and see what happens. But uh, really, really enjoyed this one, and I'm looking forward to to what's to come. Mm. Yeah. Yep. So what does that bring us to? That brings us to September. Uh, it's the ninth month, uh, but we've got a, a different number for you, Kenny, that you're interested in for this month. Indeed. The number that we're going to dial now is the 11. 9-11. Well, that's a very foreboding set of numbers. Oh, my goodness. I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> my goodness. I hadn't thought that. That's very foreboding. But yeah, we spoke about this last time I was invited on to join you, and I... I think I enthused quite a lot about how much I'd enjoyed this set. Enthused some ways. Well, I, I, why not? <laughs> I really enjoyed this trio of tales. We've got the Eleven and his own companion, who is in fact his wife. Not just his wife in this, but also Mark Bonner's real wife, Lucy Gaskell. That's right. Yeah. And they're here in a world where people have 
two minds, so you, you're never really switched off. You're always working pretty much 24 hours a day. So as soon as you've finished with one part, then the other mind takes over and you carry on. And here we've got the 11 who's obviously become fascinated by this world and wants to ramp up the number of minds that they have so that everybody is like himself. But it's a fabulous story, particularly the second part where we discover that the eight is perhaps not as pure and nice as we thought he may have been. And fabulous stories. The Doctor and Constance, of course, coming up against them. We get Constance having multiple personalities here as well. Uh, she falls under the Eleven's plan. But it's just three very, very different stories and just hugely entertaining. I absolutely love them. And it's very hard to to dislike the Eleven. I think he's Mark plays him with such a, a verve and vigour and so much charm as well. And you really can't go wrong when you've got Time Lords played by people who are larger than life with fantastic characters. Mm. That was another segue for you, Philip. Yes, speaking of Time Lords with amazingly <laughs> huge... Uh, this this has been a great year for The Master in various incarnations. And another great box set's come out, which is another Missy box set, uh, which is Missy and the Monk. Uh, so during the last box set, um, Missy joined forces with Rufus Hound as the meddling monk. And Rufus just makes a great monk. Uh, it, it, I really adore the character of the meddling monk. I mean, on TV, Peter Butterworth played him with Panache in you know, two different stories. I can't understand why they never brought him back because the whole concept of a Time Lord who just likes to meddle and just, you know, muck up things for their own bed, you know, he's just such an ideal, simple, sensible Time Lord character. And so when Big Finish brought him back, first of the guys of Graham Garden, who played a wonderful meddling monk throughout the Eighth Doctor range, because um, you kind of like him because you can't not like him. And Rufus Howard brings that same quality. He's funny and he's gorgeous and you sort of feel a bit sorry for him because he's so outclassed by Missy, who's just so bizarre and crazy. And I think that's what Missy brings in, in terms of um, just the craziness. And, and Michelle Gomez is just an astounding actress who you just don't know what you're going to get. And so I don't know how much the script writers just, you know, write the lines and then just let her go for it. Certainly in the TV show, that seemed to be what happened. Uh, because you just don't quite know what performance she's going to give. So three great stories. I'm just going to focus, though, just on James Goss's opening story. Um, James Goss is just an amazing writer, just crazy as with lots of what he does, and his output is just astounding. So Torchwood has been... He's written nearly every single Torchwood episode this year, which is just mind-boggling task itself. But he writes, writes his first episode called Body and Solace, and for the whole episode, the monk, monk's brain is in a carpet bag, which is just the most bizarre concept. It's kind of, kind of the brain of Morbius. And then you've got the whole Mary Poppins carpet bag with, with the monk's brain inside it, it's sort of, which you'd think would be pretty disgusting, but it's just so funny. And it's just at war, and the missus on one side guarding the war, the monk's on the other side guarding the war. But the whole time, Miss is manipulating everything. So if you just want a, a really fun time, but it's just so clever and twisty, turny, and just little t twists at the end, you, you can't go past it. And there's just some hilarious scenes. There's one one on the edge of a cliff with with the monk monks yeah with Missy and the monk's brain, um, and nothing that you expect could happen happens. So yeah, I, I can't I can't rave more. Love Missy, love what, the, what Big Finish is doing with her, just driving it on and on. Just picking up something you said there, Philip, if you want to know how much comes from Michelle Gomez, there's an episode of The Power of Three, which was devoted to the Missy audios. And we hear from the writers as to just how much they do and how much they leave for Michelle to pick up on. But I'll, I mean, I'll ask Michelle at Scottish Club on Thursday night, so don't worry, I'll come back to you next <laughs> time and let you know. I was going to say, she's another mate of yours, isn't she? <laughs> Absolutely. Do you know, annoyingly, she was in Glasgow a few weeks ago and I missed her. She was literally about you know four or five miles from where I'm sitting, which is really annoying because I'd love to have met her. What was she doing? 
buying haggis. She was over. She was over in a pub with her pals, oh, having okay. drinks. Simple as that. So, oh, God, I'd love to be Michelle Gomez's pal. Anyway, sorry. No, I agree. Dwayne, what what were you listening to this month? Okay, the standout for me in September, uh, I would have to say, same as you, Philip, uh, the warmer. But I couldn't pick all the all the all the biggest ones, could I? I had to leave you some to talk about. But the other one that's equal equal first for me would be the Lost Resort and other stories. So the Lost Resort, written by A.K. Benedict, who we had on the show not too long ago, oh, our last main show actually, she, she was, was on December. Um, this was a story, a box set that was originally supposed to be released as part of the monthly range. Uh, but the Lost Resort, because of the content and the pandemic, it was decided it was probably best to put it off. And it was finally released uh, in this box set. So it's a story that features a, the, a proper return, a, a proper return, a proper ending for Adric. And it also finishes up an arc that was began with a character called uh, a companion called Mark. Uh, both Adric and Mark have been greatly affected by Cybermen. So uh, they have that in common. But The Lost Resort, AK has written a really touching story that that deals with situations that we that we all face that deals with death. So it's quite heavy, quite a heavy subject. And after speaking with AK, I can understand uh, where those ideas came from, why they may have asked AK to do that. Uh, she did a fantastic job. And not only that, but at the end of the story, Adric and the Doctor got a final scene together and it brought me to tears. Uh, I think it might be the only story that, that actually made me shed an actual tear. Uh, it was that beautiful. So I think for that, this one's a standout for me. Um, not only that, but uh, the other stories were great too. So Nightmare of the Daleks is the last story that, written by Martin Waits. That ties up the, the arc uh, with Mark, because if you've been following that arc up to that point, he'd been partially converted into a Cyberman. So, a Cyberman. so he was struggling with that uh, throughout the last few adventures. Uh, and there'd been some heavy stuff going on between the companions and the Doctor. They'd split up for a little while and gone their separate ways and they got back together. So this finished that arc. But the the story in the middle, Sarah Ward, do you remember how I spoke about Sarah Ward with uh, the Lone Centurion and her story? Well, she wrote a story here called The Perils of Nellie Bly. And uh, this one lightened the mood <laughs> a lot uh, after the Lost Resort. And it was a nice... A nice breather to have in between those two stories and uh, it was really good stuff it was a perils of pauline type i didn't realize i didn't know too much about nelly bly and what an amazing interesting character she was and so i was able actually researching a lot about nelly bly after hearing this it was so well done uh it it was also they're all equal standouts so i really enjoyed everything on this bo box set equally particularly this one, and particularly AK being able to make me cry in The Lost Resort. So uh, for that, I think this was a, an amazing standout and an amazing tribute to the character of Adric, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I have to say, I really enjoyed the interview with Alexandra. Fascinating, particularly getting to hear her singing. I thought that was a <laughs> good research there. Well done, guys. Now, the really bizarre thing about Nellie Bly ones for me that we've got a game show here called Pointless. And it's uh, we basically got to try and work out the questions that people would least know the answer to, and you know, out of a hundred, and one of the answers to, was name the you know the the person who travelled around the world, you know in you know trying to do the eighty days or less thing, and nobody knew the answer. There was a pointless answer, and I knew it was Nellie Bly because I'd heard this audio. That was literally about a couple of days after this had been released, so oh, I was quite smug about that one. <laughs> As you should be. Uh, oh, sorry to keep you waiting. Not at all. Barely a moment to myself. Have you ordered? From Big Finish Productions, the War Master, Killing Time. Perhaps the time has come for you to head back to Gallifrey and admit defeat. Defeat? The streets boil with panic. They whisper the Empress has gone mad. I'm needed here more than ever. They think that the Empire is falling. It is not. It 
will continue, and so will I. We need to move now. If she's to be overthrown, we need to strike. No. No. It is over. She's won. Are you giving up? I just need to go and pick up a few things. That's not possible. You can't be. You, you're, you're him. The master. In the flesh. You took everything from me. Now it's my turn to take it from you. Why have you come back? You once told me the truths come out when it's most convenient. Well, it's now most convenient for me. Big finish. We love stories. Mm. Now, where I'm sitting right now, there's a there's a there's a river out next to me. Is uh, there really? There is. Which brings oh, us I, to you know to your I... to your pick for October. And your segues are much better than mine, Kenny. Oh, I can actually hear my daughter's music on at the moment. Like it's almost like somebody's singing a song. Could be wrong. It's rather uh, a nice yes, melody. I've... Oh, very good. That was excellent. <laughs> I like that. Yes, my choice from the October releases was River Song New Recruit, which sees River in the Third Doctor's era, which I think Matt Fitton has mentioned in Vortex that this wasn't the original release that they planned to do. But it just feels absolutely perfect. We've got Daisy Ashford established now as Liz Shaw playing her mum's old role. And her dynamic with River is fantastic. The fact they've got that initial spikiness just when the doctor's been sent off on a mission to go and investigate something. And Liz thinks, haha, here we go. I can run the show for a wee while now and do the job I was originally brought in to do. And then River shows up and pretty much is uh, running the show once again. But I think it's just a wonderful set of stories. There's just such a good mix. The fact you've got seeing what River would when River comes into Liz's life and Liz is in some sort of uh, dystopian, utopian life of everyday people at home. And then the final story when Tim Trelore gets to come back as the doctor and oh wasn't that incredible it's, it, it's, it's just such a wonderful dynamic and the fact you've got he's so outraged by pretty much everything that river says and does and it's just i just made me laugh and i just think it was a wonderful release and it, i just really enjoy what big finish are doing with the third doctor's era particularly as, as we've already mentioned looking forward to what's happening next with the annihilators and particularly under Heather Challenge is a new producer. So, yes, I think it's an exciting time ahead. But, again, fabulous. And Alex Kingston, just absolutely adorable in this. Fabulous stuff. Yeah, I don't think I'd heard Tim yell as a third Doctor, yell quite so much as he was yelling in this uh, in this episode that you're referring to. It was absolutely amazing. He was yelling at her, but then going, oh, that is a good idea. I'm kind of interested in that. And so he, he was going between outrage and fascination <laughs> with this person. That was great. Well, of course, Alex Kingston's fabulous in everything she's in, and she's going to appear in the one I want to talk about. Um, but I, I'm actually cheating a bit, because <laughs> I, I want to just talk about all of the Dalek... Uh, oh, Empire. Sorry, uh, Dalek, Dalek Universe. Universe. Yeah, I, always, I, I keep saying Empire, too. It's hard I to, know, to get that out of my head. I know, Dalek Empire's in my head, because you know, Nicholas has so created the whole Dalek Empire thing. But Dalek Universe. So the special event for this year, and we haven't really referred to it up until now, so this is a good point to I think that's, bring it up. that's an indication of the quality of the stories. If we haven't mentioned this yet, it man, really, there's been some good stuff, because this was uh, good. <laughs> it, it was good. So um, once again, the advantage of the pandemic is the fact that David Tennant became available for a lot more recording. And so the big project he was working on this year was Dalek Universe. Um, and so Dalek Universe is set before the Time War. So the Tenth Doctor is sort of flung before the Time War through the t through whatever barrier that there is there that should be stopping him from being able to travel there. And he's flung and he's, he's teamed up um, with Anya Kingdom and Mark Seven. So Joe Sims and Jane Slavin become his companions. Now, it's a, it's a fascinating dynamic. That, so John Dawn is the script editor and he's really been the one who's put all this together. And you can feel John's hand throughout all the stories. Some of them are, are really breathtaking and dark. Um, others are much more lighthearted. But the thing about the whole um, Dalek universe is it's Terry Nation. And so what all the writers are doing is 
all the writers are picking up on elements of Terry Nation, which, of course, are in nearly every show that he writes because he just recycles the same story over and over again or similar concepts. And so you know, you've got the radiation, you've got the, the invisible creatures, you've got the... Uh, yeah, so all, 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 the, all the tropes that just Terry Nation uses turn up again. And so the mechanoids come up and all, all other bits and pieces. And, of course, Mark Seven... Kevin uh, McNally comes up. Kevin McNally comes up. Um, and so the security source forces that Terry first created for the Dark Master Plan, and then he would then write a stage show for and other bits and pieces and books and things, they become fairly significant. So it's just a beautiful um, situation of stories as, as David Tennant's trying to work out how to get back to his universe, as opposed to the Dark Universe he's currently in. Um, and and Anya, Anya Kingdom and him, of course, the Doctor and Anya Kingdom have a interesting history because there's a whole season of Tom Baker um, with Anna, who was actually in deep disguise. It was actually Anya herself. And so there's this betrayal that has happened where you actually had a whole season with a, a new companion with Tom Baker. But at the end of it, you work at, he's been betrayed by her. And you've actually got David Tennant dealing with this betrayal that's happened in the past. And what does he make of Anya? Can he trust her? Mark Seven is a character played by Joe Sims, who I just adore. And I wrote a tw- tweet about how much I hate John Dorney, uh, to John Dorney at one point. I was with you <laughs> on that one. I was with you on that one. <laughs> because of what, what one of the things that um, John Dorney does. I don't, know, I don't know what John Dorney is about male doctor companions, but there's, there's something going on there. John, why do you keep doing what you keep doing to them? Uh, but the interplay between those three characters is marvellous. The stories are all very different. Um, and this last set, we get, we get Davros. We get a lovely story with um, River Song. You get the Mavellans and some history of the Mavellans and backstory there. Really, really valuable, worthwhile stuff. Um, worth getting the box set. And David Tan is, is just being wonderful as the 10th Doctor. Absolutely. Can't disagree. Cannot disagree. It's a fabulous series. And again, I haven't mentioned it either. And it's just been, it was a real highlight of the year. Looking forward to some more New Tenth Doctor. I think the relationship with Anya and Mark is great. And it's just a shame that it's only going to be the one run. But yeah, fabulous just to hear David back. Um, I'll tell, I'll send him your regards at Scottish Club on Thursday, of course. <laughs> um, although he doesn't get in too often because of his Mockney accent. But yeah, it's it's a fab series. I've re-listened to it actually over the last couple of weeks. And it's just, there's just so much to it. It's so rich. There's so much colour and so much Terry Nation in there. And I just loved it. Yeah, the Terry Nation stuff just makes me laugh. But yeah, it's, yeah, it deals with the great issues of war. And speaking of war... Well, that brings us to my pick, because we're going to be talking about a Torchwood. We've each of us picked a Torchwood uh, so far, and this is my pick uh, as my favourite Torchwood of 2021. It is The Great Sontaran War, features Gareth David Lloyd as Yanto, and I'm going to read you the blurb, all right? The Great Sontaran War has raged across the cosmos for millennia, and finally, it is coming to the Earth. Major Craig has been dispatched to carry out a strategic assessment of the planet. He'll learn about the dominant life form, decide what the world has to offer, and discover the ultimate value of the human race. For Torchwood, there is only one place to put him. Welcome to the Mumbles Bay Caravan Park. (laughs) Now, if you were reading that and you'd never heard a Torchwood audio before, you would think, what the heck is going on here? And if you're watching on YouTube, I'm going to have a cover of it uh, uh, just to our right on your screen. And you're going to, you're going to see Major Craig holding a basket with a kit, a cat in it, uh, with a caravan behind it, which is obviously Major Craig's caravan, and Yanto. It is the most ridiculous idea. This is, re- this is written by James Goss. We've been talking about him from the very first story that we mentioned on this episode of the podcast, and he's still going here in October. Um, I can't even tell you the the detail of the story, but I can tell you that I came away from that feeling completely fulfilled as a consumer of entertainment. It had everything in this. It had humour. It had a message. Um, and there are critics out there who say, oh, the Sontarans have just been turned into comedy, comedy elements. Well, 
to them, I say, well, if you, you look at the way the Sontarans were brought back into the new series, we did have the serious Sontaran with the Christopher Ryan version. We had, but Dan Starkey always was that comedy one. And Stephen Moffat must have liked that comedy element too. And I think Dan Starkey does it very well. I think there is a place for comedy in the Doctor Who universe. Uh, we can still have serious Sontarans, which I think we had in the most recent series as well. But Dan Starkey just does an amazing job. Um, Gareth David Lloyd was also featured in, in the Torchwood pick of yours, Philip, earlier on. So he's always good value as Yanto. He's got a great backstory in Torchwood, so it's always good to see him. The interaction between these two is, is fabulous. I'm a caravanner myself, so I could relate to the caravan park setting. So it really, the whole thing was a, a perfect package of, because Torchwood is often very dark, very heavy. And this was a nice change for a Torchwood to have lighter elements to it. There, are, There's a bit of darkness in it for sure, but there's lighter elements and comedic elements in it that you don't often get in a Torchwood. Um, like we, the, the, the Torchwood you referred to earlier, uh, Kenny, there's lots of comedy in that, but it's a different kind of comedy. It was a bit more um, cynical comedy in that. This is lighter. Uh, in this one. And I, I really like that about this. So because of that refreshment, this is my pick for favorite Torchwood of, of 2021. Um, Next to the name of his cat. Was it Mumbles? Grand so, Marshal Cat. Oh, that's right. Grand Marshal Cat. Yeah, yeah. What was the, what did I say Mumbles for? Mumbles Bay, Caravan Park. Mumbles that's Bay, right. Bay, yeah. yeah. Absolutely brilliant. You, you would think that it couldn't possibly work, but this is a story that you have to hear to believe. You absolutely have to hear to yeah. believe. And if I haven't sold that, I'll eat my hat. Yeah. All right. You're not wearing one. Well, let's just call this a hat, my headphones. <laughs> okay, we'll go with that then. Okay. All right. Now, I can't think of a good segue, Kenny, for November. So let's ju you're in a bit of a dilemma here. You had two to choose from. Let's go for your honourable mention to start with. Yeah. I thought I might as well join the gang since you guys have had honourable mentions squeezing in there. So I've gone for another Ninth Doctor story with a Scottish link to it. Of course you do. And it's one that I particularly enjoyed as my favourite Shakespeare was always Macbeth at school. And then to discover that Big Finish had done this story with the Ninth Doctor meeting the real Lady Macbeth in The Curse of Lady Macbeth. Brilliant, fantastic script from Lizzie Hopley, who is just such a clever writer, loves her horror, and Macbeth is pretty much a horror in disguise, and really, really good. Uh, loved doing this. Did an episode of The Bear of Three all about it, and spoke with one of the actresses in it, Lucy, who actually lives in the next town from me, from where I grew up. Uh, same town as Andrew Smith as well. So yes, there's a few connections from Rutherglen. Also, Robbie Coltrane's hometown, not Rutherglen, Australia. Rather, you make wine, but it's named after our wee Rutherglen in Scotland. So I don't know if you've heard of Rutherglen, Australia. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Well, it's named after Andrew Smith's hometown, and uh, there we go. But yes, that's not my main choice. My main choice was I Jacoby, which was Scott Hancock's fascinating chat with Sir Derek Jacoby about his life career and everything else and I put this on just thinking oh, I'll do this in wee bits and it was one of those ones where I just kept on walking and just listened to it and I wonder it fascinating just an incredible story you know I'd always assumed the name like Jacoby he was quite brought up from a well-to-do background but far from it he was London boy who just picked up a, a posh accent through his doing his acting and things like that and where he was educated and just brilliant brilliant insight into him just an incredible man who I mean by the end of it you just think I wish you were my uncle or something like that he's just such a fascinating incredible life so many stories and the fact that he's he's with Scott definitely helps the fact that they're friendly and able to chat about everything his sexuality growing up and how he came out to his parents and just Oh, it's, it's fab. I hugely recommend it if you haven't heard it as yet. Mm. Yeah, it's brilliant. I, I haven't I haven't heard it. I think I started listening to it, but I didn't finish it. But every time I hear Derek and Scott together, I get a sense that they're really good friends, uh, which I think is um, 
is really nice. It's nice to listen to. And, and so that's what appealed to me about, about this release was that they're actually good friends. So we're going to get two, fr we're not going to get an interviewer and an interviewee. We're getting two friends talking to each other. Um, so yeah, that's what's, that's what struck, struck me about this release. Yeah. So yeah, I, I mentioned before, I mean, Derek is just amazing. There's one of my favorite films of all time is called Dead Again. It's a Kenneth Branagh film. Kenneth Branagh, Emma, um, Emma no, what's his what's name? Emma Thompson. Emma Thompson, Derek Jacobi, Andy Garcia, and Derek in there is just astounding. The role he plays, um, if you, if, into a bizarre, suspenseful murder drama mystery thing. Uh, it's hardly anyone's ever heard of it, but it is amazing. Dead again, well worth it. So, um, I'm. Just a quick honourable mention because we're not going to mention otherwise. Unit Nemesis came out. The Unit series is, is brilliant, and I really and I really could go on. And there's a there's an Australian story in here again. Um, I love that one too. <laughs> the, the, the two Australian mentions we'll mention them. Or Chase Warriors. Yes. Yeah. So it, it, hey, it really, you get uh, Ice Warriors in the Aussie outback. I'll have to let you get the uh, box set to find out. Get the box set, but I, I really could have raved about that. But I just want to mention the fact that um, Survivors is back. Um, Big Finish once again did that evil thing. They gave away a free episode of the very first box set, and it just caught me. And so I've been getting Survivors since it's been released from the very beginning. I never watched the TV show until after I, after the first five or six box sets. I went back to watch the TV show. Loved the first season. Some of the second season's good. Not really worth it after that. Um, because once again, Big Finish have just done it so much better. And so when when the whole series ended um, a few years back, I was a bit sad. They sort of said, oh, that's it. So when I heard they were bringing back Survivors with New Dawn, uh, I was pretty excited by that. And once again, Andrew Smith does the most amazing um, episode, but also Catherine Armitage, who's still a fairly new writer we've had on the show, but just she has an amazing episode. And once again, hate John Dorney, because <laughs> what he's with some of the direction I think he's given in there. And um, Behind You by Roland Moore. So three great stories. I was just thinking that maybe it was going to be a bit more positive. That, you know, it's set 20, 30 years after the last series ended. 15, um, isn't it? It's 15, isn't it? Anyhow, it, it, it's quite a while longer. And there's now a provisional government. And I, I was assuming the tone was going to be slightly less bleak. But from the very first moment, it's not. So uh, this is a spoiler. Uh, you know, Abby spends the first nine box sets trying to be reunited with the sun, which she finally is towards the end, but nothing happens like you'd want. But finally, at least they're together. And then this starts with her son's dead in the coffin and she's bringing him back to bury him. Um, which itself is just tragic in terms of, oh, you're kidding me. And then what happens to her son in the next five minutes is equally just shocking. Um, I think Survivors is so good because it really looks at the human spirit and A, how people can survive through through the worst of times, but also how bad people can be. And I don't think there's any show which is as bleak or as dark as this, but it really captures humanity. Not in, not in the best light, but you do actually have some characters who you just see driving to be the best they can possibly be, sometimes with dreadful ends for them. Um, so you don't want to, if you're, yeah, do you want to listen to this? If you want to feel happy and uplifted, this isn't the, this is the box set for you, but for just amazing, stunning acting, um, sound design once again is just amazing. Um, uh, music by Nicholas Briggs, um, Ken Bentley's directed, the, directed it. Um, it just, yeah, everything about this thing just works. Um, and you know, Carolyn Seymour, Lucy Fleming, Louise Jameson, um, the three of them are just amazing together. But, yeah, bleak stuff happens. So expect the worst. Did it put you off having a barbecue? <laughs> um, when I realised what was going on, I was just horrified. It was just, yeah. Anyhow, you'll understand that comment later. But we are going to be speaking with um, one of the authors of that series, Andrew Smith, next time. And I've been putting that episode together, and um, it was it was a yourself combined with Andrew talking about how Andrew Smith's this is his favourite series uh, to write for. <clears throat> um, I gave this a listen, and yes, it is pretty 
darned incredible stuff. In the second episode, Louise Jameson gives a perform performance. Yeah, she gives a performance that is just out of this world. And uh, that when you say sound design, it is totally different to anything else that's out there. Because as you know, I'm not a, I, I haven't really got right into the Survivor series. The the early box sets have only ever heard the first one. So um, this is this has been great. It's made me look forward to what's to come because there's new ones coming very soon, and uh, also looking back as well. So I'm waiting for those bargains. Big finish. Very good. All right. So. For me, I'm going to choose as my November pick one story in particular from the Ninth Doctor set that came out called Lost Warriors, which uh, all, all the stories were great, but this one really blew me away, and that's Monsters in Metropolis, and um, it's a Cyberman story set on the film set of Fritz Lang's Metropolis, and... Uh, because I, I love the movie Metropolis so much, I was really invested in this. And uh, John Dorney, of course, has not let us down. Once again, with this one, it is an incredible piece. There's a, a scene between the Doctor and the Cyberman at the end where they're watching the completed Metropolis, which is incredible. It's also interesting to, to think that, that they've seen that version that no one else has seen since then because it, it was lost. A lot of it was lost after that um and nick briggs puts something into the cyberman that is is more human that than i've ever really heard before it's uh really 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 outstanding stuff um another thing that i picked on picked up on was the the time that it was set i think the year is about 1926 so this uh, this is a, around the time that Germany was in a bit of a having a bit of a hard time, and uh, there were the the rise of certain political elements, and even one of the characters in there used used the used the phrase "my struggle" in in the story. So I yeah, he went, yes, he's making a reference to to Adolf Hitler's book there, Mein Kampf. Um, so there's interesting an interesting story there with that particular character. One of the assistants, I think it was, uh, on the set. Um, and the other character that I really liked was was one uh, played by... Her name was Anna... can't think off the top of my head. Dreyfus. At, Anna Dreyfus, yes. Played by Helen Goldwyn. Now, I've already mentioned her once before um, in our chat this evening, but Helen Goldwyn plays an amazing uh, character here, or she gives an incredible performance at any rate. Uh, as as uh, a Jewish person living in that time, and the doctor actually goes out of his way to to give her a little warning at the end. I think that's a really nice touch. But there's so much jam packed into here. Uh, Fritz Lang uh, is great to to get some interaction there. Uh, if if you've seen the movie Metropolis, you'll see where the Cyberman influence is in the character or the robot, which is called Hell. Uh, no, the robot's not called Hell, but it's based on the uh, protagonist's wife who had died. I think her name was Hell. H-E-L. Uh, so, yeah, it was it was the standout Ninth Doctor release for me, Monsters in Metropolis, for this year. I don't know how you guys feel about that. Uh, yeah, I thought it was a truly amazing episode. I think Helen Goldwyn's performance was astounding. She's such an amazingly talented actress and singer. I've, I've been tweeting some of her songs she's been releasing at the moment because she, just seeing her on stage and singing, she's amazing. Um, as well as directing, as well as writing, just this woman can do anything. I think it's interesting that the greatest villain wasn't the Cyberman in this story. <laughs> there was, you know, worse villains than the Cyberman. And yeah, John Dorney really manages to hit all the emotional beats that you could possibly want in this story. His passion for film is so evident. And yeah, what he managed to get into 50 minutes is just astounding. So yeah, it's a great, great release. Yeah, concur. I think particularly the we can see where the story is going for Anna Dreyfus, and I think Helen brings an awful lot of passion to the part, and to that particularly that ending when the Doctor knows what's happening, but he's not telling her what's happening, and just think, get out of there, and you really just want her to just think, go, just go now, get away before it gets a lot worse. Yeah, I, I loved it. I thought it was a great script, very clever, and some some very nice touches in there, um, which John's taken from 
biography of Fritz Lang as well. So yes, they're they're there to be found. Like his directing by numbers stuff, fabulous, really good stuff. So we finally reached December. 2021 has been a great year, but the year is not yet over, Kenny. Indeed it's not. For me, the year had only just begun in December with the year of Martha Jones. Uh, fantastic release, finally giving us Prima Adjaman in Doctor Who stories once again. And here we have her on the run from the master and set during the events between the Sound of Drums and Last of the Time Lords. And just what brilliant stories they are here on the run. And I was completely unexpected for the fact there would be stories within stories. And of course, there were going to be stories within the stories. But that completely threw me. And it was just so good to hear the talk of Fane again. Just that, the menace in those childish voices. And just, there's so much there. Loved that. And Freema herself, brilliant, working brilliantly with Ajo Ando as her screen mum, Francine. And just, it's just so good to hear. I mean, I, I was always someone who was quite a big fan of Martha and that whole unrequented love that she had for the Doctor things that, yeah, we've all been there at one time or another. And I think Martha is quite often overlooked by a lot of fans. And I think Freema just, just excels in this part. And it's just so lovely to hear her going back and playing Martha once again. And who knows, this? I mean, the fact that the way the story ends, there's basically room for more stories to come. So it'd be lovely to think that it could happen in the future. I have no idea if they're planned or not, genuinely, but I just loved it. I thought it was a fabulous release and a really good way to end the year of Big Finish with the year of Martha Jones. Mm. It, it wasn't what I expected at all, which I think is why I really enjoyed it. I, I wasn't expecting the extra storytelling that was going to happen inside it. And there was, yeah, there's some really clever twists. It was a very good release, which was, yeah, unique. Excellent. It's it's one that I haven't heard yet. So I'm I'm really looking forward to that. Another one I haven't heard yet, and, and the, this is probably because I've been busy listening to Jago and Lightfoot Series 14, uh, but uh, is your choice, Philip? Yeah, so I thought I'd finish with another Blake 7. Um, once again, there was so much this month I could have chosen. And, and I think, too, you listeners, you can probably hear the fact that we could actually go on about any of these releases with a lot more depth than we've even touched. Because, you know, all these stories we're talking about and others have so many different lays upon them. Uh, and it's just so interesting. So, uh, unfortunately, we <laughs> it probably doesn't feel like we're rushing through these, but we <laughs> have done. Um, but there's just so much more to be said because of the, the, the skill and the writing behind here. But I'm going to um, do one more of the worlds of Big Finish, which is Babin the Butcher. Uh, I love Colin Baker. I think he's the most amazing actor. He's, he's a lovely human being. And, you know, anytime he gets a chance to spend time with Colin, he's just so generous and he's kind and he's funny and witty. And so seeing him come back, not as a doctor, but as a great villain in Babin, um, to me was just, once again, another masterstroke. I assume they were all going to take, all these stories would take place before his one appearance in Blake 7, which is the city at the edges of the world. But in fact, he survives that. Um, and there's a story set long before, one set just before, and then one set after. And so the fact that they've actually kept him alive is... And, and they, they've done it through a very clever plot contrivance in the very first story. Um, all these stories are all written by um, three very talented women. Um, and so Catherine Armitage has another story, Lizzie Hopley and Elizabeth Miles. These three women are just writing on the top of their game at the moment. Um, they brought back another story with Jenna Stannis, and so we get a very early, an earlier story. So this is the earliest Blake Seven story this now, uh, with Jenna in terms of her smuggling days. You've got a really bleak, um, bleak, bleak story. It's not quite Survivor's Bleak, um, by Lizzie Hopley. Um, and then we also get to have, um, Villa back as well. And so having Michael Keating return back, um, was just a lovely touch because he just brings a lightness to touch. So, Babe is consistent. There's another character that's consistent throughout, uh, which is really, she's really well played um, by Abigail Thor. So she plays a character that has actually been introduced in the Clone Masters, which was another series earlier. The cast is on, on top of their game. Colin Baker just can play anything. And certainly the second show, he's trying to win over people. And so you see a really soft side. And you kind of hope he actually maybe is 
the good person. Because once Travis appears, Stephen Greif appears in that episode, you're thinking that maybe Babin's going to be the good one, but he's not. Um, so, yeah, if, if you love Colin Baker, if you love Blake Seven, um, it's it's three great stories. Yeah, can't remember enough of them. Dwayne, what's your final pick for the year? My final pick for the year would be Stranded 3, which is uh, interesting for me because there were two releases previously, obviously, and I think it t- it's taken me a while to get into Stranded because of how different it was to the others, particularly, I mean, Ravenous was huge, epic finish to, to the series. And it was just stuff going on in, in a momentous way. Uh, and then we got to, to Stranded and they, they purposefully did it. They did it deliberately, uh, brought everything down to earth. The TARDIS has stopped working. They're living a suburban life. And I think, I think, I, I didn't connect with the Eighth Doctor so much, particularly in Stranded One, and I, I, he, he was getting a, a quite depressed about being stuck, and it made the Eighth Doctor a little bit unattractive to me. But now that the TARDIS is starting to repair itself and they're able to go certain places, the Eighth Doctor is becoming a bit more uh, like his old self again. So it just shows how intrinsic the TARDIS is to the Doctor as a, as a character. We've been able to see him go from that depression and he's coming out of it. But um, slowing it down gives the opportunity to bring out the character stuff, which is what I really love. And there's there's two stories in this set of four that really stood out to me, and that's Snow, written by James Kettle. And he's an author that uh, that we're both appreciating more and more, Philip. I know we've spoken off air about him uh, quite a bit. Uh, Snow was an incredible character piece uh, in, a, in a number of areas. Uh, and ju- what just happened by John Dorney was the last episode. Uh, I really love the way he did this. It was an experimental uh, episode where it started at the end and it went right back to the beginning uh, to give you any. And but the way it starts, there's some revelations that come out right at the start that sort of keep you hooked all the way to find out how that uh, that revelation that you heard. Oh, you think, oh, how did that? How did that happen? Where does that come about? Where does it come in? Um, it, it, so, actually, it actually starts with the cast list. And I actually... Um, that's right. I, 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 I started I, listening and I thought, I, oh, I, I must I, have fallen asleep and I went to rewind it. I checked my phone because I thought yep. I've done something wrong. And yep. it, starts, it starts with the cast list and then the closing credits. I think that's what he wanted to do. He yeah, wanted no, to, no, he wanted no, to no, have no, a bit of fun with us. Yeah. Um, that's darny. And it that's, worked. Mm. It worked. He got me. Got me big time. Uh but that in itself was a hook to get me intrigued at how this was going to play out. So um, after going from a series that, you know, I wasn't totally an amateur of, um, I'm just really hooked on it now. I think this is one that I'm going to go back to and I'm going to listen to with more appreciation. And I'm really looking forward to how it all plays out in Stranded 4. So that's my pick for December. I can tell you. I've got the scripts for Stranded Four sitting on my laptop just now. I just downloaded them today. Yeah, of I'm course just you about did. to start the preview for the next Vortex. So blah, blah, blah. I'm afraid I don't know anything that happens. I haven't read them <laughs> yet, but yes, I like I really enjoyed these, particularly I thought Snow was a wonderful piece and it was not what I expected. And I just love that whole image of snow in one garden just coming down in the doctor's house and just think it's what a beautiful image that is as well. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to listening to that one again and obviously going on with series four. Yeah, it's a beautiful exa- Snow is a beautiful examination of loss and grief um, done in a really sensitive way. So we've we had a couple of shows because we, we've already mentioned The Lost Resort which is another one that actually looks at the, those issues as well. Um, there's, there's nothing like stories is there for helping us to examine life, examine issues and to feel. And, you know, and, and if people are going to change and, you know, let's face it, we've seen in the last couple of years the best of people and the worst of people. But to actually help people change, you need stories to lead them through emotion to see the reason to change. And, you know, that's one of the things that we've seen a lot of this year. A lot of stories helping people to understand life better, people better, process better, to make themselves better. So, bravo. 
Absolutely. Rogue's dead, sir. Jack wants you to fulfill your mission. To find out about humanity. And report back to the Sontaran Empire. <sighs> what could possibly go wrong? From Big Finish Productions. Torchwood. The Great Sontaran War. Let's battle commence! <laughs> I am the most intelligent creature on the Mumbles Bay Caravan Park, let alone the planet Earth. Ya crackers! Let us advance on the other shower block and stain the drains red with the blood of our enemies. There is a problem with your turn. Someone is coming to help. I do not understand. Stop hitting the checkouts. I shall not scream! You will never hear us on time and scream! You have a cat! The internet is mostly about them. Therefore I have acquired one. For a search. Finally! This is the great Santaran War! Big finish. We love stories. Witcher! I demand you release us from this luxury hotel and spa. So I think 2021 was a great year. It was a little bit classic Doctor Light. Mm. Uh, I, did we have any Seventh Doctor apart from End of the Beginning? I don't think there was any, was there? No, there wasn't. No. So N No Second Doctor at all. No, yeah, No Second Doctor. So um, that's, that's obviously going to change in 2022. But despite that, Boy, there were some some momentous things happening in 2021. We had Christopher Eccleston making his debut. We had the incredible Dalek Universe series, uh, and uh, lots of lots of other great things going on as well. Your final word for for 2021, Philip? Just yeah. Once again, we've we've picked out only three three, and there's other stories that are we could have talked about too. So yeah, if we didn't if we didn't mention the story, it's not because we didn't necessarily like it or listen to it. We probably did, but yeah, there's just too much, too much to be able to talk about everything. Great, great, great stuff. Yeah, I agree. There's so so many great things there. Um, I mean, we've really we've sort of like probably covered not even half of what we could have talked about, and uh, of course that's nearly two and a half hours we've been chatting. So that's quite. Oh, I don't envy the edit job, mate. Um, but no, I think it's been a 2021 was a really good year considering everything that was going on in the world. The fact that Big Finish was able to carry on producing so much stuff, so much high quality content, and the fact that the writers have been able to carry on working, actors have been able to. So, yes, I think it's been a great year. And here's to 2022. Excellent. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, really looking forward to it. So, thank you so much, Kenny. For, uh, for joining us. It's been great to have your company. Pleasure as always. Thank you for me. And you're, no, 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 I'm just double checking, you're Scottish, aren't you? Is that right? Just in case we've missed well, I've heard this rumour that I might be just possibly yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Kenny. Okay. Thanks for audio files. Thanks audio files for listening to us as well. It'd be great to have you on board. Excellent. And uh, make sure you catch up with Kenny on his other podcasts. They are The Power of Three and Pieces of Eighth. Uh, particularly, I, I really enjoyed um, the uh, Matthew Jacobs interview you did uh, recently. Uh, he, he's, a, he's, a bit of a, he's a bit of a fan, isn't he? He is. He's, in fact, he knows his big finish as well. He's heard about big finish and he's heard some. So, yeah, it's quite, quite impressive. And he's such a lovely fella as well. Very laid back, very easy to chat to. And yeah, still get the odd message from him on Facebook and Twitter. Just say hello, how are you? So yes, he's a good guy. Awesome. All right, until next time, we will catch you later. See you guys. This has been the Sirens of Audio episode 88, the best of Big Finish 2021, with your hosts, Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny, and our guest, Kenny Smith. Theme by the Jackpot Golden Boys. Thanks for dropping some feedback for us if you're listening and a like if you're watching. We really appreciate it. Our Facebook, Twitter and Instagram handles are all at Audio Sirens. And our website is sirensofaudio.com. Now, if you've got this far in this behemoth of a podcast, congratulations. Now, stop listening to podcasts 
and detox with some quality audio drama. Because audio drama... Rawr!